Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we proudly bring to you Mormonism Live! Shut up and sit down. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much. How are you? Hi, Mr. Real. How are you doing? Life is good. It is so good. Well, I'm glad to hear that. You're making me jealous. Well, I, uh, I'm sorry about that. I, um, I'm, yeah, things are going really well, you know. Um, Christmas is coming up. We're a few weeks away from that. And uh, I've got a daughter who will bring our third grandchild up uh, with her. And... Uh, uh, and her uh, boyfriend, and they'll come visit with us for a couple of days, and we're really excited to see our grandkid that we don't see very often. You know, it sounds wonderful. I yeah. understand you're a great granddad. I am a great granddad, three times. Well, fantastic, fantastic. Yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us about your personal life before we get on with the show? No, no, no. We can just get on the show. <laughs> I, I will say, just uh, <laughs> folks, we've got a lot of new subscribers to the channel, and. Uh, uh, if you see new people in the chat, by the way, if you're watching live and you're new to this, uh, feel free to say hi. The folks in the chat will be super kind to you. Um, they're a fun group. And uh, it, again, I could add a ton of things, but I don't take away from tonight's show. So um, new folks, I hope you really enjoyed tonight's episode. I hope I hope you do. I know I have had a lot of fun preparing yeah. for this episode tonight, which is episode number 106 of Mormonism Live titled Desnat exposed mm -hmm. today's date is december 14th 2022 and we have a special guest on tonight but before we get to our special guest by the way the special guest is called in he called in at the end of last week's show when we were talking about violent language from church leaders or language that could be seen as promoting violence either directly or indirectly we had a number of examples and ryan who's our guest tonight had called in and we talked with him over the week we arranged for him to come on the show. He's willing to do that and talk about the inception of Desnat, in which he was involved. But first, first, we're going to go to a news story from early 2020, 2021. I think it was in spring of 2021. It's an ABC news story. And I thought it would be a great thing to start out to give us a bit of a primer on Desnat and who they are, what they like to do before we get into talking with our guest. How does that sound, Bill? Sounds good to me, let's do it. Mormon Twitter, yes, it's a thing. It's buzzing about the hashtag Desnat. It stands for Desert Nation. Some say it's an alt-right group of Latter-day Saints who want to purge the religion of those who oppose it. Those who are part of the cause say they're just encouraging people to follow the prophet. ABC 4's culture and religion correspondent, Andrew Reeser is in the studio with us right now. So Andrew, please explain. Well, Don, for LGBTQ users and some former and active members of the church, hashtag Desnat, which first surfaced months ago, represents what they call Mormon extremism. But those who believe in Deseret Nation say it's just a social media push for Latter-day Saints to get back to basics. Defending the truth, trolling, or threatening. Talk of give apostates the knife or let's let's do a blood atonement. This Twitter user, afraid for his safety, uses the alias Brother Mike. Mike no longer believes in the LDS church and says users of hashtag Desnat have harassed and threatened him and others online who oppose the church's views. I don't know what they're capable of. Some are really, really, uh, you know, alternate right you know, extremists. I don't know how else to put it. No one who believes in Deseret Nation wanted to talk to us on the phone or on camera, but did send us several definitions of what they believe Desnat followers are, not extremists, but members who are, quote, unapologetic about our belief in the restored gospel. But what about memes bearing the Desnat hashtag depicting a family shielding themselves from groups like gays, feminists, and Muslims? 
some Twitter images even suggesting knife violence against those who oppose the church's views. One does not believer calling for a blood atonement or a sacrifice of apostates. Less extreme users simply say they follow the prophet. But Brother Mike is worried for anyone with opposing views. They really do think that they're doing the church a favor, that they're defending the faith. Now, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is staying out of this for now, but they did refer me to past statements about their views on race, immigration, political neutrality, and fairness for all. For those views, you can visit abc4.com. Back to you. So there's the end of the first news clip. We get a brief update on what it is that Desnat is about from both perspectives, from the perspective of Desnat, who says that they are just faithful Mormons, they're following the prophet, and other people who are in more marginalized groups, perhaps, who find them threatening and outrageous and dangerous, potentially. Um, do, do extremists ever know that they're extremists? No, extremists never think they're extremists. <laughs> Every extremist I've ever met thinks they're a moderate. Yeah. Right? Extremist is something. Coming to a reasonable conclusion. <laughs> yes. And I will tell you, I did have to laugh when the reporter at the end said that the LDS church is staying out of this for now. And I'm going, what are you talking about? This is your church. Right. These are you. You can't stay out. That's not an option. You're already in it. Yeah. It's not like you're a third party observer watching a flock of geese go by and saying, oh, well, we're going to stay out of that. We're just going to watch. This is your church. These are your members. And I find that response inadequate. What do you think about it, Bill? Um, I think that this tonight's episode is going to tell the story uh, in a well enough fashion that I think for any reasonable person, a.k.a. not the extremist, and maybe even a few of them, uh, I think that tonight's episode is going to help lay out that these views are, um, they go too far. Well, if we could bring on Ryan, we're just going to use his first name for tonight, although that is, I believe, his first name. If we can bring Ryan on. There's Ryan. How are you doing, Ryan? Good. How are you doing, RFM? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Thank you. By the way, one thing I want to start off with asking you is that we've got these two different opinions uh, does not say we're following the prophet, other people saying, no, they're dangerous. And I'm looking at that and saying, I think it's the same thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> and wait, yeah, wait they're not really describing two different things. They're describing the same thing from two different perspectives. Yeah. Yeah. Way to, way to start it out there. <laughs> well, thank you. Anyway, Ryan, you had called in last week and that started the ball rolling and getting you on the show tonight. My understanding from talking with you, which we've done quite a bit over this week in preparation, is that you um, intentionally or unintentionally are one of the founding members of this organization. Yeah, uh, I mean, one, I, I, I don't know that I'd call it an organization um, because it wasn't, maybe it's organized since I've become disaffiliated with it, but I was there for a lot of I, what I think are the founding events in the modern era. Can you tell, in, us, in any case. Can you tell us about that and why it was and how it was that you became involved in the creation of a group that led to this. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a spokesman. I mean, bear in mind, I've changed a lot. We'll get to my journey a little bit as well. And I know it's not a Mormon stories episode, so I'm not going to tell my whole story, but so a lot of people don't know what the origins are. And even that news report got it wrong saying it was just a few months old. Um, you, what you kind of had was a, you know, maybe a Venn diagram of different groups of people within the church that were driven together into this Desnat umbrella, right? For lack of a <laughs> more appropriate term, you had some of the prepper types, um, which, you know, some of them were very extreme, some of them less extreme. You had very political people, members of, you know, political caucuses and things that were driving it from a political side. You had the Ammon Bundy types, you had fundamentalist Mormons uh, and polygamists even that were driven towards this. And even just some everyday Sunday types that thought they were doing the right thing. Um, and, and, and how it started wasn't what it's turned into completely now. But uh, for my story, you know, I was born in downtown Salt Lake. I was in Ezra Taft Benson's home ward when I was born. And my parents were very politically conservative, 1980s Reagan Republicans. Um, my mom campaigned for Bob Bennett. I helped when I was a teenager. 
Um, I used to joke that when Ezra Jeff Benson held me as a baby, he gave me his powers <laughs> to <laughs> fight liberalism, right, and communism across the world. Um, but that was kind of the the political milieu that I grew up in, and I was a political science major in college. Um, I was also involved uh, in the competitive shooting and, and right to bear arms community uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s. And so much so that as shooters kind of gravitated towards this new thing called the internet and, and internet forums, Mormons began to find each other. And we kind of got tired of debating with non-Mormons, a lot of evangelists and, you know, or evangelicals and, and others out there. And so we created a web forum called Zion's Camp of all names. Yeah. And Ryan, can I just take you back? For, yep. Ryan, just for, take ahead. you back for a second. What was your impulse yep. to do this? Where did you feel like you got your marching orders to do this? Uh, I didn't feel like we got marching orders. I felt maybe as I try to think back on it, did I feel inspired to do it? Probably. Right. And, and that was from our readings of Doctrine and Covenants, Section 134, which talks extensively about the Constitution and about the duty of people who are, if they're protected by a Constitution, to not rebel. But if they're not, they need to defend the country. Um, it was from the White Horse Prophecy, which the church is now, I, as I understand, kind of disavowed. But it was Very pretty much. big on the Internet uh, at the time. Um, there are there are other books. There's a By the way, when book. you say... Right. When you say the white horse prophecy, I know that you're using shorthand and I also know that you're trying to go quickly and I appreciate that yep. in order to fit within the structure strictures of our show. But the white horse prophecy, for those who don't know, one of the main things in it that I think is attractive to Desnat people is the idea that in the last days, the Constitution will hang by a thread and it will be the elders of Zion who step forward to rescue it. Yeah, that the people will be saying, let's divide up the United States and call it quits and they'll hold it together. Right. Um, and it was it was various uh, other books, the Book of Mormon. We were, you know, big on the Book of Alma. We were the ones who liked the war chapters and didn't skip them. Um, <laughs> there's a book called Signs of the Times from like 1952 by Joseph Fielding Smith. It's a bunch of his talks about that. I have a first edition copy right here. Um, oh, and, and, and Ezra Taft Benson had a, had one about the Constitution. Um, I can't find my copy of it, but um, I think I lent it out and then apostatized, so I didn't get it back. So, <laughs> and there's a, a whole stack of books about Porter Rockwell, and these are just some of them that I had. But, I mean, Porter Rockwell was kind of the main hero, and, and I had a, a spinoff of Porter Rockwell as my username and everything else. Um, okay, well, let's go back to Zion's camp. By the way, was yep. there any... Um, Anything that the church said about going online and defending the church? Yeah, that came a little later. Uh, that came oh, okay. as, as, as we moved towards 2008 and Proposition 8, right? So, All right, well, go ahead. Um, you got Zion's so, Camp, a website. Yeah, so Zion's Camp, and it was just it was just some gun guys that liked guns. And then there was a lot of a this rhetoric creeping in, more about this end time stuff and things like that. And we all believed it. It was what we were taught from a very young age, and we all kind of grew up with it. There were some people who were more extreme than others, and we tried to self-police the really extreme ones. We didn't allow any fundamentalist Mormons on there. We kicked them all off when we found them, um, you know, because we were the right ones and they were the apostates. But uh, it kind of generally, you know, radicalized more and more and more. And I found myself um, in a place around 2007, 2008 with a new website called Twitter, that came out and the way Desnat kind of grew out of that was at first there was a news story about the Texas secessionist movement group in Texas that wanted Texas to secede from the union. I think about um, Obamacare or something of that nature, they were politically dissatisfied and somebody on Twitter, it wasn't me, came up with the idea, hey, you know what, Deseret was a nation too and we should have stayed a nation. We should have never joined the United States it would have been better as a theocracy under Brigham Young. And we started using Desnat semi-ironically, but not too much. I mean, we kind of believed it as a hashtag on Twitter. And it's kind of gone up and down in popularity um, over the years. But right about that time, we hit Proposition 8. And I remember being told from the pulpit, we need you to go online and defend the church in debates online. Uh, I think they read a letter from either an area presidency or even the first presidency. I don't, I don't recall, but they read a, an official letter from the church over the pulpit. 
And we took that as marching orders. That was go for it. Let's, uh, you know, Proposition 8 was a big deal. And even though personally it sat contrary to one of my values, which was really live and let live among people. And and, it, and I believed and always have believed that if, if God was about free agency, that we shouldn't be telling people what to do. <laughs> um, it, those were my marching orders and I believed in the church and I was going to go out there and help the work by defending the church and traditional marriage on social media, because my marriage was in danger. If, if, if they got what they wanted. Oh, right. So you were, you were buying into the argument, which was promoted by at least some members of the church that if gay marriage were allowed, it would be the destruction of all marriage basically. Right. And I turned off my brain and I didn't think about it anymore. I just, no more critical thinking. I'm just going to go out there and do, do the work. And so at first on Twitter, it was debates and then it became memes and gradually the memes became more of a competition between some of some of us to outdo each other and push the envelope and kind of an end under themselves because contentions of the devil. And if I can make you mad, then I win. That was a shortcut to winning the argument. If I can make you mad, then I win. And that's how it felt. And it became more of a, you know, a game and, and, and trolling out there. And, you know, I'm ashamed to admit all of this, of course. <laughs> can I jump in here? Well, Please do. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. So um, I guess firstly, before I jump into that, I just wanted to show I'm repping the merch. I guess it's kind of going a little on my green screen. The yellow is getting a bit see through. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, say thank you to RFM for ordering this for me. And thank you to Exmo Shirts for uh, making and sending it. So but to get back to the point what Ryan was talking about, um, this is something that I feel is an inevitable end to anyone that wants to try to defend the church, you know, via this does not route is because at the end of the day, the ideas are indefensible and just not, they just don't conform to even what the church is today. And so I feel, I feel like, I, I think anybody taking on this endeavor or feeling like they're going to go on Twitter or any other platform to defend in this way will very quickly end up going this route of um, just get, getting down to trolling and just making people mad because that's all that the power there is. There's no power in the arguments. The church doesn't back them officially. Most members don't even back them. So at the end of the day, that's all you've got. And when you when you can't defend your beliefs, then you have to attack the critics. So. Well said, well said. Do you agree with that, Ryan? Or do you have? Any yeah, I would about say. Said? Yeah, all that tough guy bluster. Looking back on it, was really just a, a tacit admission that the argument has failed, and the willingness to, and especially now when we see, we'll talk more about the violent stuff that that came, thankfully after my time. But, um, you know, it, it's that willingness to fight us over what's true and what's not means they've really run out of arguments, and run out of facts. Ryan, I would be remiss if I did not ask you what the worst, most outrageous meme was that you created and in what context did you use it? Um, I didn't create a lot. I would I would use ones that other other people created and I would use a lot of the stock animated uh, GIFs on Twitter that you could send to people and reply to their posts. So someone would put up a post, you know, it would usually start with someone posting something about how they were dissatisfied with the church's position on proposition eight. And I would reply to that with, you know, uh, an animated image of someone choking themselves with a phone cord or something that's not directly violent, but is just insulting enough. And just, I mean, that I'm ashamed of right now, but that was not necessarily, I didn't mean it to incite violence, but it was more of like, completely discounting them as a human being, right? Because I'm behind a screen, I'm tough, and you're behind a screen. And so none of this is real, but yeah, I I don't even remember what I was trying to say with that, but it was mostly just trying to get people mad. You've described a loose affiliation of people who are like-minded in this regard. How is it that uh, this competition takes place? There must be some way that you and others are seeing each other's work in order to compete and try and be more outrageous. How did that right? Look? So you could you could search for the hashtag Desnat and you'd always put that on your post or and um, 
so you'd see all those those come through your Twitter feed, and we were connected to following those people on Twitter, and so you'd retweet their memes, and they'd retweet your memes, and so if your if your meme or your even your quote something you wrote down in an argument was retweeted a bunch of times, that was great. If I got reported a bunch of times to the moderators, that was a badge of honor for me, right? Mm -hmm. I wanted to make people angry. Um, so can I just and, underscore something before yeah. we go on, because it'll tie up to something we're talking about at the end of the show tonight. Mm -hmm. It was very common then for Desnet members to retweet Desnet memes in order to give them wider audience and wider visibility. Right. Yeah. Especially if you thought it was a good one. Yeah. And I'd retweet somebody else's to, you know, somebody who was making the opposing argument or, or whatever it was. And I mean, remember, there was none of the new kinder rhetoric uh, that the church has had to adopt as, as time has gone on towards the LGBTQ community. It was war during 2008. It was outright war. I want to ask you about the feeling that you had and that was shared by other members that what you were doing was sanctioned and approved of by top church leadership. Yeah, um, I wasn't hard to find. I'm not hard to find now. I wasn't hard to find. People people knew who I was. I never once got a call from a bishop, a stake president, anyone up higher in the church. We saw their silence as approval and, and, and as, hey, we cannot back you on these things, but we're glad you're doing what you're doing. We, we, we really saw ourselves as you know, like Porter Rockwell, oh, it would be a shame if Governor Boggs got shot, you know, he gets shot, right? It was, yeah. we're not going to give you direct marching orders. And we, there was, there was talk among us of like, God expects us to kind of do these things for ourselves because the church can't get its hands dirty. And we were never disavowed. Right. So just the fact that the church did not come out and say, we don't endorse Desnat. You took not that publicly as or not publicly or in private. And it was, it was possible, easily possible to figure out who I was. Right. And when you say the church didn't say anything or the bishop or the state president or anybody up higher about you, you're out there under your Zion's camp website, correct? Uh, Zion's camp was the, the web forum we started at, but at this point we were, I was, it was just on Twitter, mostly the Desnat stuff. But again, it was pretty easy to find out who I was. Um, I used the same handle on all the websites I used. And so, you know, a little bit of cursory research would have had them find us. We had a contact form for people to find us on the Zions Camp website. So somebody could have easily seen my Twitter username, Googled that name, found me on Zions Camp and sent me an email. No one ever did. And I know the church tracked down bloggers all the time because they paid bloggers that did like, you know, pro-Mormon blogs. And, and this was the time when the church was investing in a lot of those blogs. They didn't pay us, but they didn't stop mm -hmm. us either. Can I jump in? Right. right this yeah, go ahead. Yeah, please. So a couple of things that I'm making note of. Uh, White Horse Prophecy makes it clear that there are this small subset of Latter-day Saints who are going to save the Constitution as it hangs by a thread. That If you are one that studies that, and I've got folks down here in southern Utah, Utah that were big followers of Abraham Gileadi and all that stuff mm -hmm. that went on. So there absolutely are subgroups of Mormons who are deeply zealous. If they're informed on the White Horse prophecy, by its very nature, it dictates that there are a certain group of Mormons who will rise above the rest of us, who will be stalwart, who will not fold when, when everyone else is folding. And then you've got scriptures that say, few there be that find it, and even the very elect shall be deceived. And then you've got, so, so there's this idea that the rhetoric we have both in our scriptural canon in our prophecies and in our uh, modern rhetoric, almost says that uh, that you need to you need to rise above the rest of the fold of Latter Day Saints and be prepared to do extreme things because those are the folks who are going to save the world inside the church. And then yep. I want to add something here. Uh, let me change. The I have something to add to that when you when you finish that. Sure. <laughs> Notice here at the very bottom, this we went over last week. This is Boyd K. Packers to young men only. And it was about that incident where he suggests that maybe fending off uh, a homosexual advance. Notice what he says here. After learning a little more, my response was, well, thanks. Somebody had to do it and it wouldn't be well for a general authority to solve the problem that way. 
when you read between the lines, what he's saying is at my position, you're not going to catch me doing that, but I do give you permission to do it. And so when Mormonism wonders where the idea is that the leaders are giving tacit approval, even though they're not saying so directly, it comes all through out our history in statements like this. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Mormonism is all about feeling superior and special to the rest of the world. And we were that much above, right? We, we just felt that, it, I mean, I, personally, I felt that I had a special calling and my patriarchal blessing, unfortunately, backed it up that I had a special okay. calling and a special mission. It said that I had a special mission, not the mission that I was to be called in the mission field, but I had a special mission here on this earth and it, some vague allusions to things of that nature. And it was, um, and I, I don't have it here with me right now, but it was very easily readable if one wanted to read it that way and wanted mm -hmm. to read, wanted to insert themselves between the lines, which unfortunately we do in Mormonism. Um, right. You know, you make your horoscope come true and, and being one that was kind of driven to that. And I kind of look at it like this. It was drilled into our heads that the book of Mormon was written for our day even though all it does is solve, you know, theological debates of the 1820s and doesn't address any of the social problems of our day. It doesn't address things like homosexuality, you know, transgender, political, you know, ramifications ab ab above a certain level and things like of all of these kinds of issues, but which we could frankly use a lot of direction on if it was uh, an inspired book from God. <laughs> but what the Book of Mormon does con contain is a lot of violence and so there are a certain segment of us that, you know, we're left to assume that that's the solution to the problems that are not listed in this book. You know, that we, mm -hmm. that Captain Moroni solved problems this way. And, you know, like you said at the beginning of the last episode, there are, these are people that took Mormonism seriously. I did. I was a stalwart member. And, and they're the people who are bored in Sunday school lessons. And as boys, there's a certain segment of us that are naturally inclined to do and be are look, looking for the most exciting way we can contribute. Right. And that mm -hmm. was, you know, we're, we gravitate toward that warrior archetype that is all over this, you know, Bible fan fiction that we had. <laughs> was that what you wanted to add, Ryan? Cause I wanted to take you in another direction. Um, it's actually a similar direction, but first off, was that everything you wanted to say uh, at this point? Yeah. Yeah. That, that was everything I wanted to say. The main thing I want to talk to you about is this idea. Uh, that the leaders are approving tacitly or secretly or silently but we get to this point and i'll just talk about my own experience because going deep into church history and finding out about uh, blood atonement or adam god or all the things that were taught before that the church doesn't teach anymore because they don't emphasize it they don't teach it anymore right they just let it simmer back there and somebody like me finds it because they haven't disavowed it what I do is I thought that this is the truth. These are the deep things that the church is always telling me about. This is the meat that I have now yeah. found. And since I found it, the conclusion which I reached was this is the truth. And the church leaders know this is the truth. But you're going to find what you're looking it. for, right? <laughs> yes, they can't say it publicly, but I but they know it's true, too. So we have this sort of connection between us. We both have the same understanding. They're not talking about it, but I'm assuming and knowing that they believe it is true as well. Right. Is that similar right. to Desnat? Yeah, I think so. In fact, I think very much so. That was very much my feeling was like, these are the things you're supposed to learn something new every time you go to the temple. You're supposed to learn the, the meat of the gospel on your own and through revelation. And these were the things that I felt called to do because mm -hmm. of my upbringing because of my patriarchal blessing because of just my natural inclination to like certain things right um because of the politics i was involved in and the the people i was surrounded by um there are active members of the church right now who are angry with the perception that the church has shifted left on a number of things and i've talked to a lot of these folks that believe that the secret combinations have gotten into the church leadership and have taken it over from within and they're waiting for a restoration and they're not they're not leaving for the snufferites yet those people will be driven you know some of them will be driven that way some of them like me will leave because of you know we'll talk about my story but there are people that i've talked to they're still in that are full believers in the gospel of mormonism 
but don't believe in the leadership. And so I think even much like polygamy, if they were to come out today and denounce the Desnats, there would be plenty of them that would say, you know what, they had to say that to protect themselves. We know what the truth is, and we're going to continue to do this and be ready. Ryan, will you hang on a second? I'm going to surprise Maven. And I'm going to ask if Maven can find, it's a little bit further on in the slides, the statement from 2017 that the church released about their opposition to groups like Desnat. They don't come out and say Desnat. And it wasn't necessarily we exactly about we Desnat. We would definitely have taken that soft language as protectionary lawyer speak. I tell you what, Bill, are you, if you're available, Bill, yep. or Maven. Yeah. Let's go to Maven. Sure. I want to hear more from Maven. Can you read this? Uh, this is from Tuesday, August 15th, 2017. The church released a statement, and this is what it said. Okay. Um, it, it's funny. When you said you were going to come to me, I was taking the sweater off because I was too hot. So I thought you were going to have me like, <laughs> come on when I'm trying to get this thing off. But um, yeah, so this is the statement. This is in response to the Charlottesville um uh, murders. So it has been called to our attention that there are some among the various pro-white and white supremacy communities who assert that the church is neutral toward or in support of their views. Nothing could be further from the truth. In the New now, Testament... Can you stop there? Can you yes. just stop there? I'm going to take out this stuff because now they're going to quote the New Testament in the Book of Mormon. Mm. Okay. Can you go to the next, the final line Paragraph. there? Paragraph, yeah. White yeah. supremacist white supremacist attitudes are morally wrong and sinful and we condemn them church members who promote or pursue a white culture or white supremacy agenda are not in harmony with the teachings of the church says an all-white leadership yep right <laughs> well right thank you the racism yeah, so I it's very easy for myself for... go ahead go ahead I was just going to say, oh, I was just going to say, it's very myself. easy for me to see that and say, oh, well, obviously Desnat is under this umbrella. They're condemning Desnat. Why would anybody in Desnat think that the leadership supports them when the church issued this statement? Ryan. I would have ignored that because I didn't see myself as racist. Frankly, I was only as racist as I was a Mormon, <laughs> which was pretty darn racist. But I didn't ever see myself as a white supremacist because all I did was believe what the church believed about race. Right. So we get into this interesting psychological situation where a group of people loosely affiliated believe that they are the elect as far as the the strong men, the strong arms who are going to come out and save the Constitution. They are going to be called upon. They're like a standing army almost or a militia, if we want to talk yep. about it in that way, who will fulfill this necessarily violent role in the predicted future of the church from Joseph Smith. OK. And yet, when the church leaders who they think support them come out with a statement like this, they are unable to see that the church leaders are actually saying what they mean and actually believe that the church is saying this only because they have to say it politically. But what they really believe is that they still support you. Is that correct? That's correct. And I would have seen it as, hey, yeah, sure. White supremacists aren't allowed. We weren't Nazis. And people would call us Nazis, maybe, but we we didn't feel like we were Nazis. Right. All right. So now we're at the point here in the show where Bill and Maven and me a little bit, but we've we've gone out. We've tried to find different images from Desnet members that have yep. been used on the Internet. And we want to flash some of these up here. Oh, can I and say briefly one get you? Yeah, please do. Thing. Just that yeah. I, I kind of would lose interest for six to eight months at a time and be in and out of it. And by about 2015, I was I was gone. So a lot of the, the newer stuff that has gone on within Desnet, I can comment on and I recognize, but um, it has shifted. We can talk about how it shifted um, over the years since then. But I think I made one post about the uh, policy of exclusion and I wasn't feeling it and, and I deleted it. I had a hard time with that one. And I just added it to my shelf though and, and stepped away from Twitter and from Desnat for good. Okay, so that, around 2015 then? Yeah. We're gonna get to that second part of your story after these slides. I remain faithful so for have... some time, so we'll talk about that after, yep. Okay, and I'm really looking forward to that. Here we've got a couple of slides with the idea of an umbrella and Desnat 
is the umbrella that's protecting the family, presumably the good Mormon family, from evil influences such as the Salt Lake Tribune, by common consent, which would be, I think, the blog. Um, CES letter, that's important to protect the family. I understand they got a real hard on for Jeremy Reynolds. Uh, I probably shouldn't have said that, but we can't edit it. It's live. Also, a, a postage. Her Hashtag a little, post Her skirt's a little high for a good Mormon family. Well, she probably has slacks on. Okay. She is white and delights them, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, the, the gay presence at BYU has to be protected or defended against. And then there's another one that has a similar idea, but the family's holding the Book of Mormon to protect them against all of these uh, other religions and political ideologies, communism, Islam, LGBT. This is probably an old one before they got the Q and the plus. One is liberalism. And probably the one in the middle is that black power or um, the one with the fist. Yeah, um, I think so. It's a combo. Yeah, well, maybe. Yeah, it's BLM, but you can see there's the the plus at the bottom, which is for you know for feminism. Um, oh, do you see? It's kind of I I think they're yep. combining it. What they're doing there is uh, women's rights and Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. So, but I, okay. a lot of times the women's rights will have the fist in too. So it might just be women's rights, and but I'm sure they would be happy to put BLM in there as well. Right. There's only so much room in this. Uh, this little thing you can put that they're protecting the members of the church from. So there's this one, not particularly violent, certainly shows their attitude and how they view themselves. What's the next one we have? Okay, so on the left, we have a person who goes by militant Mormon and a picture of a guy with sunglasses saying, hey, kid, want to blood atone some apostates? And then on the right side, we have another from, once again, militant Mormon, hashtag apostate. And I don't know if that's a stake through the heart or some other kind of stake, but there's a picture of a knife here. And it's just really a picture of a knife. Hashtag it's a little tiny knife that a whistling they, Hitler would use, one of those young men. They call all of us apostates members of the apostate, you know, like a stake in Zion, right? Okay, so who is the, who's the apostate? And and I don't know if they came up with it or if the apostates, you know, if if us ex Mormons were the ones who first picked apostate. I, I I wasn't mm -hmm. engaged with that, but it may have been, hey, you know, a group of ex Mormons that picked apostate is their kind of hashtag because I think this is sending a message to the apostate. Hey, look at my Bowie yeah. knife. Okay, all right. So these are the kind of things that are getting a little bit more uh, violent. Here's some more. We've got one from LDS Beard that says where dem apostates at hashtag desnat and then so they've got some missiles that look like they're ready to shoot off <laughs> the next one is we do a little uh, this is by well, i can't even fanfic hope hicks fanfic whatever we do a little larping it's called we do a little larping is that supposed to make sense LARPing i don't is understand live this. action role playing oh okay we do a little larping it's called we do a little LARPing and then a bunch of people with uh, smiley faces over their faces. So you can't see who they are. That's a big thing. It seems in most of these that we are not allowed to see the faces of these individuals. For some reason, they want to protect their, their identity. Is that They're a common? Scared. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't common when I was there, but we didn't post pictures of ourselves with weapons either. We were smarter right. than that. Okay, well, I'm glad to hear that. And these people do have weapons and a flag in front, which has a beehive. And what's that below it? It looks like some kind of, is it an ax? It's a uh, fascist, which is the Roman ax symbol, which was where the word fascism comes from. Oh my gosh. Well, that's right, of course, because those were, I have a bare knowledge of it. My classics education is somewhat lacking. But right. It's the first time I've seen it, but that flag, but. Oh. That is a fascist. Right. Okay. And that, that was carried by a person as a sign that they were a legal and designated representative of the emperor, correct? I believe so, yeah. I think so. Okay. It's on a lot but, of government buildings too, but. And all if right. You just, if you just Google fascist acts, that picture of that act shows up all over. Yeah. 
So it looks like a symbol of fascism or fascism underneath the symbol of the beehive. So they're putting those things together. We've got a few more. Now below here, we've got a, a buoy knife. All right, we've got a buoy knife. We've got a patch that has a flag on it. And we've got a patch that has Moroni, the <clears throat> statue or the angel, the kind that we see on top of temples. And we used to see on the front of copies of the Book of Mormon. Can you take us with a buoy knife first? Because these three are symbols that are important to the Desnat crowd, correct? Uh, yeah, I believe so. I, again, some so, of this stuff comes after me, but they're things I've seen. Okay, now we're gonna get to the buoy knife a little bit later. You don't have to tell us too much about the buoy knife. Tell us about this flag. The flag is, it looks sort of like a United States flag. It's got stripes but it's blue and white. And then it has in the field in the upper left-hand corner, a circle of stars with one larger yeah. star in the center. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that ever made it into production during Brigham Young's day, but I believe that was a proposed Deseret flag that, uh, okay, so you know, I've seen, you know, they, they ran it up the flagpole on Ensign Peak a few years ago and got it taken down, who? of course, by somebody. So Desnat people ran it Desnat up the flagpole on Ensign Peak? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this is their banner then. That's their banner. All right, and the idea is that we wanna go back to the glory days of Brigham Young when... When it was a theocracy yeah, not yet. and when a apostates got blood atoned. <laughs> okay, thank you for putting it directly. Exactly, yeah. and so they wanna get out from under the thumb of the federal government, even the Utah state government, they wanna reestablish what the dream was, which was never realized, completely of having a theocracy because the federal government kept, you know, monkeying with the works and wouldn't let them right. do it and kept putting up problems. And that's its own history lesson. But it's like this idea of Camelot. Right? Yeah, and I believe they claim Utah, most of Nevada, and like an arm that goes down to San Diego for their deep water port, right? So right. it's, and that it's was, LARPing at its finest. <laughs> yes, and that was the area, the landmass that Brigham Young wanted to have as the state of Deseret. Right. I, I wanted to say that, um, as it's been pointed out in the chat, that technically all of that was Mexico. Deseret was never a nation. Um, and so uh, Brigham and the Mormons were all illegal immigrants there, which I'm sure Desnat would also, an idea that they would love, I'm sure. Nailed it. Yeah, I think there, there were more refugees. I guess you can be both at the same time, huh? Okay, so, um, and of course it was Mexican territory for like a year after they got there and then US won the Mexican-American War and bingo, it's an American territory. It's a US territory. But yeah, exactly. So that's a really good point. Thanks for bringing that up, Maven. Now there's the buoy knife, there's the flag, and then there's this patch. We got a patch over here on the left and then we have an individual who has a ball cap on with the same patch on the front of the ball cap. Are you familiar yep. with that patch? Uh, just from seeing it in, in recent years, I it wasn't something that existed during my time, although there were people who designed similar things like that. You know, I, I, I've i seen different ones. I've seen ones where Moroni's holding a rifle. I've seen, you know, a couple different designs, but that one I've seen just recently when I saw that picture of the guy in the bottom right corner. Right. So it's a patch on a blue field that has the words with the word Deseret underneath, has a picture of Moroni or a representation of Moroni standing on top of a beehive. And around the edge is written holiness to the Lord, but it's written in the Deseret alphabet. Yep. Which is why I can't read it on site. As Brigham Young's attempt to keep people from speaking English, <laughs> being able to read English. So we got Deseret twice, Deseret being very important. They're in the flag, they're in the patch. We're going to get to the buoy knife. By the way, on the right, we have a new meme of Brigham Young that says apostates, no one needs you, get the knife. And then we have this friendly fellow, and we use this on the thumbnail, where he has a bandana over his face and sunglasses on, because apparently he doesn't want to be recognized. He's got two buoy knives in front of him crossed trying to look presumably menacing. And on the flag, excuse me, on the wall behind him is hanging the Deseret flag. Yep. Why do people, why do Desnet members make pictures like this? Are they trying to scare somebody? 
you know, again, this is all kind of what it's devolved into since I, since I left. Um, I, I think he's just trying to look tough. And, and I think that comment that uh, got put up by, you know, from Matthew Roberts is, is accurate. These are people who, you know, look and act tough, but live in their parents' basement and are, are just looking to fill a void. I think more and more, more than we were. And, you know, shamedly, again, I engaged in a lot of things that I don't, I'm not proud of, but this is a whole new level. And I mean, I could make snide comments about bringing a knife to a gunfight and all kinds of things, but mm -hmm. we, we just, it, it, it's really become almost a parody of itself. And yes. And this guy's uh, bringing two knives to a gunfight. Yeah, apparently. So that should even things out anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, if we can go to the next one, but I, I look at a picture like this and my first impression, the first thing I think of is he looks like a terrorist from the Middle East. Yeah, absolutely. Hiding well, the face, and brandishing weapons menacingly. I've seen a couple of recent tweets that were talking that quoted the uh, Joseph Smith quote about being a modern day Muhammad and, and extolling the values of some of these, you know, um, the Mujahideen that are willing to give their lives for, for what they believe and saying, well, Islam's wrong, but they've got it right about that. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Well, I think that, uh, I don't oh, know. Great comment, Fred. <laughs> what was it? What did Fred say? Wait, so he Desnet said, started with a bunch of marginalized, undocumented immigrants who practice non-traditional marriage. It's all in the rhetoric, you know what I mean? Yes, yep. it is. Now to the Bowie knife, to the Bowie knife and why the Bowie knife ends up being such an important symbol to the Desnet members and harking back to this wonderful golden age of Camelot that existed under Brigham Young. Um, hey, Bill, could you yeah. read this quote? This is from Brigham Young, it's 1853, and he engages in a little bit of LARPing himself, or at least dramatic. He's using a visual aid is what we would call it in primary today. Can you read this? Because this is something that actually happened in general conference. This is a go-to quote for Desnat members. It's probably up there on the wall right next to the proclamation on the family in their homes. Who said this? Whose quote is this? <laughs> Brigham Young, baby. Second and he's very president important of the too. church. Prophet, seer, and uh, revelator. That's the one, yes. Yeah. I say, rather than that apostates should flourish here, I will unsheath my Bowie knife and conquer or die. Great commotion in the congregation and simultaneous burst of feeling assenting to the declaration. So, you know, everybody's, everybody's, oh, yeah, they're all excited, right? Now, you nasty apostates, clear out or judgment will be put to the line and righteousness to the plummet. Voices generally, go it, go it. If you say it is right, raise your hands. All the hands go up. Let us call upon the Lord to assist us in this and every good work. Okay, so this ends up becoming very important for a number of reasons. First off, it underscores the use of the Bowie knife as a symbol. And also, it speaks to the idea that there are members of the church who are not sufficiently Mormon, or they're the wrong kind of Mormon. So we're going to call them apostates. They're members of the church, but they're not orthodox enough, if I can put it that way. They're not devout enough. They're not committed enough. And here's Brigham Young saying that rather than apostates flourishing here, which would be out there in Utah, I will unsheath my Bowie knife and conquer or die. I think it's pretty obvious why this is so attractive to Desnet members. Do you want to say anything about that, Bill or Ryan or Maven? Yeah, you got to hand it to them. It's a lot more uh, interesting than calling people lazy learners. <laughs> I mean, conference would be fun again, right? Well, it certainly would. I don't re recall a bunch of people uh, doing a simultaneous burst of feeling and ascending to the declaration when President Nelson talked about lazy learners. They no, have to actually wave, wake up. We first. wave handkerchiefs. That's it. Yes, and some of them actually wave it in time. Right. So that's a good thing. I think Elder Oaks, uh, he never went to dance class is the problem. But... Um, <laughs> this is pretty blatant. Yep. I, I'm just looking at yes. this and, you know, we went over all this rhetoric last week and we didn't, I didn't catch this one. I didn't have this one ready to go. And this seems as blatant as any of them. Um, here you have the 
second president of the church. And by the way, this is where the um, this is where you know most of the the faiths that broke off after Joseph's death. Obviously, they don't believe in Brigham Young. So there's a few groups that still do that you know broke off polygamy 1890 all that stuff. But there are a certain section of us Mormons who really require that Brigham Young be absolutely a prophet and president of the church in the truest sense of the word. And here is that man giving uh, blanket permission, essentially, to use knives to get rid of those who have lost their beliefs and no longer believe in the church. Yeah, and all the members are in favor of it. They're cheering the yeah. idea on. And then Brigham Young puts the, the bow on it when he says at the end, it's a good work. Yeah. Let us call upon the Lord to assist us in this in every good work. <clears throat> yeah. So this is a rallying cry. I think this is like the mission statement for Desnat. Yeah. Okay. What do we have next, Maven? We've got some more. Now, these are interesting. We've got one from a guy named Caleb Brown, if that is your real name. Point of view, Moroni asking if you're going to be a king man or a free man. And it's got some guy pointing two guns toward the camera with a, a, a picture of Moroni's head, Captain Moroni's head, I think, superimposed on yep. his face. Right? Obviously, that guy should have taken lessons from Arnold Freeberg and hit the gym. <laughs> yes. <sighs> you absolutely should. That guy needs to go to the gym right now. You know, get off the range and get to the gym, for God's sake. Even I'm sorry, more maybe, ironic. Did you want to say something? Yeah, just um, going back to some of the ones that we had looked at where they, they had listed obesity as one of the things. Uh, <laughs> if you remember that, I just I just thought that was funny. You it look is. at the pictures of what's left of these. Yeah, you look at the pictures of what's left of these folks, and, and they're all kind of uh, fit a certain mold, and it's a big mold. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Okay. Then the, some in the middle, Desnet means never having to say you're sorry. That was posted or quoted from J. Reuben Clark. We'll talk about him later. Okay. J. Reuben Clark is the handle for the guy who's being quoted here. Desnet means never having to say you're sorry. Underneath that, there's a flag that Desnet has apparently created of its own. And then below that is a picture of Brigham Young. You know those memes where they have some guy sitting at a table? I think that's the new Utah front. flag with Desnet written on it though, right? I don't know. Tell me. Uh, I, I believe that's similar, similar, but not quite the same. I'll I'll get it pulled up here in a second. Okay. Okay. So they're they're doing a a, a riff on the the Utah state flag. I didn't know you, Utah is a new state flag. Yeah, they're getting a new new state flag. Oh, okay. Oh, so it actually is looking more. I've seen a few different ones actually. So, um, well, let me, I'll I'll go ahead and share my screen here sorry one second mm -hmm. and while you're looking at that the sign in front of brigham young they've got a picture of brigham young sitting at a table and in front of the table is the sign that says apostates get the knife prove me wrong so so this is mm -hmm. um new utah flag org so those are the there's a, the legend for the colors and stuff, but that's interesting because I, I thought it was actually slightly different. It, it had different. like some some mountains in the background or something like that. But I mean, they had but like, the Desnet one. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, they had like 20 that they had proposed and I think they had just taken one of those and then put Desnet on it, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. there was a survey that went out that gave all of the possible... Um, designs for the yeah. flag and allowed people That's to give it. their commentary. And I said, whatever you do, remove all Mormon symbols, like take the religion out of it and let's, let's focus on something else. But Same. I didn't win. Hmm. Okay. And then the last one from Desnat is a picture of, it's a photograph of president Nelson. And he appears to be holding a very long sword. It looks like a katana is what Maven said. And I think like it does. It looks like a katana. Columbus, doesn't it? Part of the Knights of well, Columbus. Well, it could be. <laughs> now, I think that I, I'm just guessing that that huge long sword is photoshopped into his hands. But the, yeah, I the think question, that's a shovel. Oh, of course. He's, is it really? He's right. holding a shovel? For, 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 I, a think it, I think it was a shovel from a groundbreaking, and they put a sword in there. Of course. That makes sense. And that's why he has the white gloves on, which doesn't look Masonic at all. Maybe he's but practicing for yeah. Tyler. A little Masonic humor there. But getting back to this <laughs> meme that tweeted. 
uh, where it says, who else is loving the new handbook? Now, I think that this DesNet member is talking about the change in language in the handbook recently from saying members are excommunicated to we're withdrawing their membership. OK, so now the excommunicate word is crossed out and it says, I think above it, it says, how about instead of excommunicate, withdraw your head from your neck? Yeah. That's shades of temple penalties too. <laughs> oh, right. President Nelson with his long sword, instead of excommunicate, how about we withdraw your head from your neck? And when I saw that, I thought, you know what a, a better meme would be? How about this? One, two, three, let's go chopping. <laughs> <laughs> uh, city hey, idea. If you guys need some more ideas, if you want something that's actually creative and funny, you can use it, okay? I just don't don't give me the attribution. Yeah, don't give him any credit. <laughs> yeah, I usually want the credit. This time, no. Forget about it. I'll know. It'll be our little secret. Okay, so what's the next one we have, Maven? Maven, would it be possible if you're able to? I'm starting to get croaky. Could you read this one from J. Reuben Clark? Once again, remember that name, J. Reuben Clark. He's going to come up. He was a sure. big dog who got taken for a walk. He got taken to the pound eventually. Take, take it for a walk. Um, so he says, maybe it's the influx of new people to hashtag Desnet, but a lot of you are mixing up progmos and mormies. Progmo, political leftist, doesn't really believe in the church, sticks around so they can corrupt it. Mormi, believes in the church, but too dumb, naive, or wimpy to oppose progmos. I just thought that was enlightening and um, this other one I found, it says, oh, can you hang on before combo. you go to the other one? Oh yeah. If you just, I just want to mention here that they of course are the elite guard, the Desnap people. They're not progmos and they don't like progmos and they are going to go after the progmos. The Mormons are not quite so bad as the progmos. They're not the enemy, but they're not helping because they're too dumb, naive, or wimpy to oppose the progmos like the Desnap people are. And, and this is a form of like a no true Scotsman fallacy where they put themselves as the true Mormons and everybody else is something less than. Well, and it's right. a riff on the, on the internet word normies, which means normal people. Right. Oh, thank you. I, I didn't catch that. Now this other one that you found Maven. Yes. So um, just to describe it for those who may be listening, it says name a better combo. I'll wait. And then there are four pictures. One is of the sea, one is a millstone, then the, the third is a rope, and the fourth is a screenshot of the Exmo subreddit, the best ex-Mormon forum on the internet. So I think, of course, the scriptural implication here is, is taking from the scripture where Jesus says that those who hurt children, it would be better for them for a, mill, a millstone to be hung around their neck and cast into the sea. So I find that really ironic that instead of their to replace people who hurt children they're using apostates i don't know if maybe the implication is that apostates hurt children or if they weren't even really thinking that far and just were putting that in place but i also found it especially ironic considering the church's history with um child sexual abuse cases and the cover-ups and the and the number that basically they've um not condoned but i allowed to happen uh by protecting predators who went on to to do what they do to even more children, sometimes uh, hundreds in a, in a ward uh, over time. So anyway, but there we and go. Yeah, up ironically to them. on that. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I, ironic. Ironically on that one, I did. I saw that tweet in real time, and one of the replies from another Desnat was, "All ex Mormons are pedophiles. Prove me wrong." Oh wow! And it was wow. Uh, yeah. And we got into it. <laughs> okay. And we're going to have to get to the rest yeah. of your story here in a second. But, oh, yeah. now this is important here because in August of 2021, were we going to go to that right now, Maven, or we're going to save that for later? With, um, well, with the, the musk, wait, that was, that was for the video clip. We're, we're not to that Sorry. point yet, are we, in the outline? Uh, I don't... No, no, we'll I go don't... into Ryan's story and then we'll go into the musket talk. So 
Yeah. Yeah, Brian, can you tell us about your personal story? You, your wife, you're becoming disenchanted, yeah. and leaving this, uh, this, uh, this Desnet activity. And what happened to you and where you are today? Sure. Yeah. And, and I'll be as quick as I can, of course. But um, like I said, around 2015, um, the policy of exclusion came out. I posted one kind of my thoughts about it, which really echoed exactly the church's position on it. And then I deleted it because it wasn't sitting really well with me. And I just kind of added what did that. You post? What did you post? Uh, um, just that this was very similar to the way we treat um, the children of uh, polygamous families and that you know, mm -hmm. everything's going to be okay. And this is an act of love. And it was really just, and I think I even just posted a link to the church's statement on it. Um, but it didn't sit with me. And within 24 hours, I deleted it. And I had moved off of a lot of the rhetoric and the, the, the intense posting quite a bit by then. Uh, I would get really like uptight and enjoy the fight with people. But it was kind of like, you know, I described it as going on a Coke bender because I was just flurry of activity and fights with people and enjoying myself online. And then I'd be short with my family, short with my kids, um, angry all the time and not able to sleep. And my heart was beating, you know, my heart rate was up just someone's wrong on the internet. I've got to fight them. Right. right. And, and so I had, I had taken that back and I was, look, my kids are getting older and I, I had a lot of stuff going on in my career at the time. So I had pretty much moved back. And at, as of 2015, I closed my Twitter account at that time. Um, I've had one since and I've closed it since, but, um, story wise, you know, I, I was raised in Salt Lake. I went on a mission to Italy. Um, I've been married for 22 years. The church was very easy for me. I was a high priest. Um, I, uh, I had been married 18 years and, um, so that was, I got married in 2000, it was 2018 and you you go through kind of the highs and lows in your marriage and i've been trying to build something new and rekindle some relationship areas with my wife as my kids had, you know were getting a little older and had really i was also running my own business at the time and had really taken to following my patriarchal blessing which talked about that my, all my success would come from my faithfulness in the church and that um and that included monetary success and so I was really doubling down on the righteousness portion of it. I was serving in high priest group leadership and uh, I was teaching temple prep. I was a stake auditor. I was busy with the church uh, side of things. I had my own business. And you started going um, to the temple more. Yeah, yep. Yeah, we were going once a month as, as a couple and I was going, I, I worked right by the temple. So I was going at lunch like once a week. And, um, and the idea is that because your patriarchal blessing says, you will be righteous and because of your righteousness, you'll be blessed with the good things of the earth or however they framed it. You're trying to be able to make the money that you need to support your family. Absolutely. Doing, doubling down on being righteous. Right. Doubling down on being righteous versus doubling down on work, which would have been better for my business, <laughs> frankly. Um, Did it work by the way? No. The temple no, attendance really and everything else. Did that get no, you money? No. I, I had no. a, I had a failed business that, you know, it was a good learning experience, but it didn't, it didn't ultimately end up saving me. Um, okay. but I, I, have you ever read elder Holland's really, talk wrong roads? Uh, yeah. 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 And I've listened to your podcast on that too. No matter what it was a wrong road, up. right? Yeah, no, no matter, matter what, what it ends up true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I was attending, attending the, the temple almost weekly and in December, 2018, they, as you know, changed the, the ceremony to be less sexist towards the women. It was, uh, they didn't have to veil their faces anymore. It changed the, fundamentally changed the covenant where women no longer covenanted to obey their husbands, but covenanted directly with the Lord. You guys did a great podcast on that, which helped me in my deconstruction. It was one of the first things Thank that you. came upon. Thank you, Brian. Brian, can you lead us up to this? Because prior to this, yes, my understanding is you yep. were trying to be what the, you thought the church was teaching the men to be in their families, which is yeah. the patriarch. I realized I had been taking a back seat when it came to the gospel and allowing my wife to be the one who taught the kids the gospel and to be the one who was responsible for the spirituality in our home. The proclamation on the family, we've got a three foot copy on my wall. It's huge, it's still there. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. But um, so I took the, the protect, provide, preside very seriously. 
And I even had a little sign that just said that. And, and I was also like reading the scriptures and listening to the Book of Mormon every day on my way to work and really just what is a man supposed to do and how is he supposed to treat his wife and how is he supposed to lead his family? And so I was leading and I was becoming a little overbearing, frankly. And uh, in 2018, when they changed that, that covenant and I sat there kind of dumbfounded in the session looking over at my wife, um, I realized that I've been mistreating her. And now, you know, in the days after that, the church was getting all this credit for being progressive and, and being less sexist and being great. And it's, oh, I'm so happy they changed the ceremony. And I was the one holding the bag as the jerk who had mistreated my wife. And, I, and I've got daughters. I don't want them to grow up with that either. And I, I just realized that the whole dynamic was not what the natural dynamic was supposed to be. And our relationship immediately got better, even as I was starting to go through a faith crisis. But it gave me permission to ask questions about what else did they change in the temple and why. Um, I had known about the penalties years before. It had always been a shelf item. And frankly, when I was in Desnat, I was like, why didn't we get to do that? <laughs> right? <laughs> you missed out. Right. I missed out because I didn't get the hardcore ceremony. Right. If we're going to be a cult, we better be the best cult around. Um, Can I mention so, something so I that you've yeah, already ahead. talked about there? This idea yep. that happens in different ways in the church. It's happened to me in a certain way. I'm not going to go into that right now. It's a different way. But we try our best to do what the leaders of the church tell us to do. And then all of a sudden they pivot and they change. And now we're the jerks because we were listening to them and taking what they said seriously and really trying to follow them. Yep. Is that what happened with you or how you felt? Yeah. And I, I immediately thought this is my, what my, the racist must have, must have felt like in 1978 when they gave blacks the priesthood, right? When they, when they suddenly pivoted. Well, if someone was heavily racist, which I have family members, older family members who grew up pre 1978 and were had carried a lot of prejudice. And then all of a sudden the church has flipped and said, Oh, isn't it wonderful that everybody can have the priesthood now? And these people who had believed all of the teachings of the church and frankly read the Book of Mormon <laughs> mm. had that rug pulled out from under them. And now they were the violent racists. They were the bad people, violent or nonviolent. They were the racists. They were the bad people. And the church was getting all the accolades for finally extending the priesthood to all, all worthy men. Mm -hmm. And when they finally extend it to all worthy women someday, it'll be the same thing. So getting back to you, when the church does this sudden pivot, on how men are supposed to treat their wives Can in the I, home. Sorry, I, yeah, please, I just wanted to ask, like, what part of the temple ceremony changing was it that um, really got you going or like stood out to you, um, making you feel like you've been treating your wife uh, badly? It was right at the moment where they where the where Eve covenants with God instead of her husband, because. Um, I had been going and really listening to that that portion of the of the endowment and and really had felt like it is my job to bring God into our home. It is my job to be I mean you almost have a savior complex, right? You're the the intermediary between your family and God. And suddenly it's not and the way they've changed it I, I want to be careful about how I say it, but it, it almost felt like they they were making a fool out of Adam a little bit in the new version. And how do you mean? Well, they were just lessening his role, right? Because he wasn't now the guy who, and and I'm I'm thinking about it with my old sexist eyes, right? So it's not how I currently feel, but at the time I felt like, man, they just made Adam into kind of a, a dupe, and and Eve was suddenly wise, whereas she was kind of stupid before, right? And it lessened his position in the endowment ceremony. And I felt bad about that momentarily. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, wait a minute, the right way to be is to be a caring human being and be an equal partner to the person that you're with, that you fell in love with 20, you know, 18 years ago. And now that the church is in line with this, I'm the guy who did it wrong. But why did I do it wrong? Cause God told me how to do it. How did I, how did I get it so wrong? Because God was giving me these instructions. 
what else am I getting wrong? What else am I missing? Because God told me to do it this way. Thank you. And for when that. you say God, are you talking about the leaders of the church speaking for God? Yes. And I don't believe anybody should ever speak for God, but I believed it was God telling me in the temple exactly how to treat people. Okay. Maven, I'm sorry. Just like I believed it was God telling me through the white horse prophecy and, and the doctrine and covenants how to treat people. No, I just, I was just going to say, I'm glad I asked because I wasn't quite making the connection. Um, I'm Because I did always see it when I went through. And of course, my very first covenant, which I, which I thought was going to be with God, because that was what I was told all growing up is that's what you do. You go to the temple and make covenants with God. And that being to a husband that, you know, never even materialized, uh, that was problematic for me. But I was trying to see what the connection was for men or see like how, what did it take away from men when women didn't do that anymore? So your perspective uh, it was perfect. And I, I see that because I feel like a lot of men maybe just kind of ignored that part that they covenanted to God or I know, but you really, you really took that in. You were really paying attention and you were, I, I am maybe not the gatekeeper, but I, I am this conduit to bring my family. I'm the conduit to God for my wife and the rest of my family. So you were really, you were really taking on that role. So thanks for sharing that. It makes a lot more sense now. So at that point in December, I think you said of 2008. I mean, to be honest, uh, I. What? Yes. Thank Are you still there, Ryan? I might have to kick him and have him join back in. Um, so I think okay. we might do that. Well, we, we certainly have some other things we can go to, but boy, when someone says, I have to be honest, I immediately want to know what it is they, they're going to say. And right. that's right when the screen froze. Right. Um, I'm sure okay. he'll come back in a second. Yeah, here he is. He's coming back. Okay, great. Ryan, are you there? Yeah. Sorry about that. Sorry. That's okay. I'm starting to worry, worry that you got blood atoned or something. <laughs> no, my connection just died. So you said um, you were going to be honest and then you froze. What were you going to be honest about? Yeah, I'll be honest. I mean, I didn't ignore it. I legitimately felt superior is the wrong word, but it's the most applicable word. I felt like it was my job and that my, and my responsibility to maintain that relationship with God for my whole family. Well, that's what I was taught. I mean, that's I what they told us. The same church, Bill. How about you? Yeah, um, the church makes it clear that uh, the family really is riding on the back of the husband, right? And so, there is the the temple uh, has that right again. Not the current wordage, but the verbiage from before. Uh, you'll obey your husband as he obeys the Lord. Um, there were numerous lessons in gospel principles in Sunday school in priesthood. Uh, about the roles that we had. Um, we were taught patriarchy from step one till the modern moment. Yep. Absolutely. And then they do the shift in 2018, which you're not supposed to talk about, right? That was also part of the the preview. There's some changes here. It's cool. Nothing's it's hidden from revelation. Yeah. God's in charge, but don't tell anybody. Right. Um, okay. So this moment at the temple, your marriage starts improving. Your faith in the church starts going the other way. Can you tell us Correct. what happened after that? Yeah, I mean, free fall. I, you know, I started questioning. I prayed a lot. I did all the things. I tried to double down for a couple months and really figure this out and do all the reading. And, you know, as you know, when you do all the reading, you start to find other things. And on the prayer side, God never showed up, right? Things didn't change. I didn't get any of those good feelings. Um, this is the time that the Corbridge talk came out and a lot of helpful people tried to send that to me. Um, we had a lesson in church about it where we watched it. What did um, you think about the Corbridge maneuver? Uh, I loved you guys' uh, takedown of it, frankly. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, I enjoyed it too. Helpful. By the way, for those who don't know, this is Elder Corbridge. He's a general authority who came up with this fantastic talk that's going to resolve everybody's doubts by just making them focus on the four primary questions and leave all those pesky uh, issues, questions, and doubts alone. And I've never seen so many logical fallacies in one place. Just bad. 
It's really quite remarkable, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's it's bad. So, but before that, I'd listened to. I started listening to some podcasts. I found you guys early on and listened to your deconstruction of the temple changes where we go back to all of the quotes where the prophet said the temple will never change. And then this new quote from the you know, current uh, leadership that says, we've been told that there will ne never be an end to this. You know, they start this ongoing rhetor restoration rhetoric that they've continued to do, um, mm -hmm. but has never existed previously. And so I started to just work backwards and see, I wanted to figure out where the church went off the rails. I had figured out that the current leadership wasn't in the right spot and no longer offered me value in my life. I did kind of a value proposition and I was like, they're not prophesying. They're not seeing, they're not revealing anything. They're not giving me any direction in my life that I wouldn't find my own. And frankly, every time I follow them, I go the wrong road, I'm down the wrong road, down Elder Hall on the wrong road. <laughs> <Right. laughs> um, and you know, then I, I, I started to find the truth that had been kept from me. Um, I had, uh, I, I've got some of my foreign language sheets from the MTC, one of them in Italian. That was, you know, one of the phrases that we were supposed to teach people was no one in our church gets paid, not even the prophet. And it was printed out at the MTC and handed to me in Italian. And that's what I was to tell people. <laughs> and I knew that was, that was wrong. Um, you know, I heard Ballard. When did you find that out? When did you uh, find out that was not true? I had found that out in pieces over the years and, and again, shelved it. You know, I'd found out, oh, it's a modest stipend and, and these things. And I just kind of pushed it away. I'd heard about the second anointing about a year before. And I had like been afraid to research it because it was so sacred. So I wasn't going to learn about it. I'd had an early mission companion that was obsessed with getting his calling and election made sure. And it was, a you know, he was convinced it was an apparition from Jesus Christ and not some extra temple ceremony. He didn't, right you know and then that's what i believed it was up until like 2017 when i heard about it from a grandson of an apostle that you know said hey this is this is what it is i, I don't want to hear anymore um you know just you put on the blinders willfully and and accept i'm gonna follow this but i always wanted to find a little bit more meat i always wanted the magic to be real you know i saw quotes by joseph smith saying every man deserves a seer stone and i was like where's mine right why aren't we using the priesthood to actually do miracles why why are, are there there no real miracles and, and the, these things and so um you know what i came to is there's not a single definitive or valuable aspect of the church that doesn't fall apart under reasonable scrutiny and i'm actually amazed reasonable at how untrue scrutiny. it is yeah reasonable yeah. scrutiny is just politics. basic scrutiny yeah and i'm amazed at how untrue it is Ryan, you said something when we were talking, uh, I think it was yesterday on the phone, about the final conclusion you came to with regard to your understanding, your new learning about yep. the character of Joseph Smith. Yeah. So within four or five months, I couldn't even bear to go to church anymore. I was still a member. I'd go and talk to my bishop and things and have conversations with him. But I continued to do my research. I continued to listen to podcasts. I continued to read and I read both sides. I gave it every fair chance to be true, but I got to the happiness letter and I found it online first and I read it. And then I looked to see if there was a podcast and you had just released one with Jonathan Streeter, Bill, um, going through the happiness letter. Um, I had found it through the, through a quote in a Thomas S. Monson talk. And then I found it on Joseph Smith papers and I read it myself and I was like, God, what is the context of this? This is weird. And so I listened to that and the realization that came to me was, there was nothing a Mormon prophet living or dead really offered me as far as value goes. And I'm a better man than Joseph Smith. I've never cheated on my wife. I've never done any of the things that he did. And I've got my own failings, but I am a much better man than Joseph Smith. And as such, I don't need him or the church. And that was kind of the, the feeling that I got in my head. And I decided to go and pray one last time and contextually you know i don't believe that it's the holy ghost anymore but the answer was i would rather you be wrong and leave than stay and do something that you don't believe in and i feel like that came from my inner voice right and myself mm -hmm. i'm a friendly agnostic when it comes to god now i don't know what's out there but i was ready to leave i submitted my resignation late october of 2019 and was out by november yeah sometimes i think that what's in here is often better than what's out there. Yeah. Now the ironic part is, is that 
my wife, who I really started down this road to improve our relationship is, is still a very true believer. My kids are all in. Um, my youngest daughter was baptized by my brother, you know, uh, six months after I left the church. Um, mm. My oldest daughter just got her patriarchal blessing. And, and the hurtful part of that is, is that my wife is mentioned in it and I am not. I am a ghost. I do not exist. You got ghosted by the patriarch. Yeah. Wow. Rules of the game. Rules of the game. I just have You're to hidden. accept it. Yep. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, very much so. I want to. Can I talk about next... one really brief thing? Please do. That just part of my story. Yeah. As I as I began kind of my exit from Mormonism, one aspect that I encountered, particularly in the online spaces on Twitter and on Exmo Reddit and things that was really difficult and actually slowed me down as far as leaving the church was politically, I had been very, very right, right wing. And the loudest voices on the internet are very, very further, further away from that, you know, they're, they're on the left, and I wasn't ready to accept everything all at once. And that was one of the hardest things for me. Um, right now, I mean, I don't believe in, believe in political parties, I'm not a member of either political party and never have been, I think the two party system is really, you know, to go on a rant is designed to divide us into tribes and make us fight with each other. But I, I had a, a hard time passing a lot of the purity tests that I found on some of the web forums and things by not being liberal enough yet. And I, what I want to say is that a lot of the people that are in my situation, the former Desnats, or the former arch conservatives in the church that are now seeing the church shift and triangulate like they did with the temple ceremony, like they've done with, you know, they've inevitably are going to have to do with the LGBTQ community. We're going to come around on the other issues. We're going to learn how to treat people right, but it takes us time. It, we're not only deconstructing the church, we're deconstructing our entire life. And there are issues that I've moved far to the left on. And there, there are issues that I'll probably still be way too conservative for ex-Mormon Reddit and they'll never like me for. I, that doesn't bother me, but I know it's been a stumbling block to some of my friends as well that weren't quite ready for all the all the political discourse surrounding ex-Mormonism because frankly the, the you know the smart liberal caring people in in the church left already and got there first and good for them yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um the people who are seeing it as not true are going to have to learn a lot of those other lessons as well and it, it takes time mm, good advice. thank you for adding that i appreciate that I want to go to Elder Holland now, because in August of 2021, yep. he gave a speech in which he referenced muskets. Now, a lot's been said about this, but not what we're going to talk about tonight, because the question is always there. Did he do it intentionally? Did he not do it intentionally? I've got no idea. But the second question is, if this is a dog whistle or if this is something that Desnap people or others of like minds could seize upon to see now in their leader an overt supporting statement for what they're doing. Would they see it? Do we have evidence that they've seen it? And yes, we found it. We found it definitely. I found one, Bill found some others. And we want to talk, start with uh, just a brief clip from that talk to set the stage. Today, scholars building the temple of learning must also pause on occasion to defend the kingdom. The dual role of builder and defender is unique and ongoing. I'm grateful we have scholars today who can handle, as it were, both trowel and musket. Then Elder Oaks said challengingly, I'd like to hear a little more musket fire from the temple of learning. He said this in a way that could have applied to a host of topics in various departments, but the one he specifically mentioned was the doctrine of the family and defending marriage as the union of a man and a woman. Right. So there's Elder Oaks being quoted by Elder Holland about musket fire in relation to defending marriage and the traditional version of marriage. Now, that was in August of 2021 and then we have something here this is something i think that bill found by j reuben clark again we're going to get to him in just a second can you read this one bill since you found it so at j reuben clark thank you elder holland hashtag desnat and it's just a church then it's just the church reference 
Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints um, announcing that institution's, uh, BYU's institution's 2021 university conference. Right. And so once we're in the mind of the Desnet people, which we are a little bit, thanks to Ryan being here and also the research that I've done, you start to recognize that if they're going to think that leaders of the church are supporting them, even if the leaders of the church are saying we don't support you, what are they going to think when Elder Holland starts talking about musket fire in relation to defending the family and the traditional family? They're going to see that as a direct sanction. And I think that's what we're seeing here. What do you think, Ryan? I agree. And I would have seen it as that when, if I had been in at that time. All right. And you found a couple others, I think, Bill. Yeah, I don't have, but Maven's going to have to pull them up. But yes, we did find other ones. Um, yeah. Did you want to do, so I had the KUTV uh, one real quick. Let's do the KUTV thing if I, if we can, because there's an individual who's a member of Desnat named Greg Smith, who apparently was running for city council in Ogden. And this story, this news clip is from December of 2021, four months after Elder Holland gave his musket speech. And what Greg Smith says on his page, his web page, or wherever it is he posts it, we'll see it here, it's is obviously, I think, influenced by what Elder Holland said. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. And this one is a little quieter, I think. Former North Ogden mayoral candidate Gregory Smith told Two News Investigates he's used that hashtag to defend church teachings. A month later, he tweeted out, quote, time to get out of our muskets. In response to an LGBTQ related post, he later deleted his account. OK, so it says Greg for council. That's why I was thinking of the city council. But then she said mentioned a mayoral candidate. At any rate, maybe the mayor's on the city council in Ogden. I don't know. But the main part being Greg Smith, a member of Desnat and using the hashtag Desnat for uh, his own purposes, makes this comment, time to get out our muskets. And that's in reference to an LGBTQ event. Time and to get so, out. And so you, you start off by noting that some of these folks look like they, you know, behave in ways that seem to indicate maybe they live in mom's basement, but now we're getting to the point where we're starting to see influential people in government offices at the local level, and it gets worse, right? Right. You're muted. <laughs> I think he's talking to you, Ryan. Ryan no, you I'm not muted. Yourself? No, I kid. I kid. I kid because I love. Okay, so. Bill, Bill, yeah, you found these, right? And these are other references to Desnat members picking up on the musket speech by Elder Holland and saying, hey, he's green lighting us right now. Yeah, Elder Oaks, I would like to hear a little more musket fire from the Temple of Learning. And then they've got an image there of somebody holding a, a firearm with a, with a dead turkey upside down. And then you've got the one next to it, Lego Joseph Smith, which is both of these. And then it's got... Uh, love is advocacy, which is sitting on the edge of a of a cliff there, of a ledge, and Elder Holland over top of a person coming up from behind him to kick him off of it. Yeah. And, oh, and notice the hashtag: Jeffrey R. Holland did nothing wrong. Right, and we've seen Brigham Young did nothing wrong before. Now, my understanding, Ryan, is that Brigham Young did nothing wrong is a slogan that's uh, very popular among the Desnat crowd. And that it's actually a riff on white nationalist slogan that Adolf Hitler did nothing wrong. Is that correct? Yeah, it's it's not a good look. Um, it comes from like the 4chan forums, which are just basically there for trolling. And people would put Hitler did nothing wrong whenever something, you know, made him mad. And, and people use it ironically or as a joke right as a poor taste joke of course but to mm -hmm. then take that and appropriate that for elder holland did nothing wrong or brigham young did nothing wrong you're you're equating him with hitler which is just stupid well right but it's just sort of like this idea brigham young did nothing wrong all of his violent rhetoric anything that he did that was violent his theocratic vision he didn't do anything wrong because this is what we adore and what we want to bring back right 
All right, so here's another one by Lego Joseph Smith. That's uh, apparently this Desnat member's handle with an umbrella next to it. And this is a picture of Tom Cruise. It looks like it would be from the first Top Gun movie. I'm guessing he has that youthful glint in his eye. And it says, Elder Holland is hashtag Desnat confirmed. Why? Because muskets. Then there's another one that says, uh, Elder Holland woke up in the morning and chose metaphorical violence. That's also from our friend Lego Joseph Smith. Lego Joseph Smith, who appears to make a lot of these memes, also says, yeah. felt might delete later, but this is what, it's the same picture of this, this old 19th century American guy with a musket and a dead turkey hanging there. But what apparently is being superimposed on it is the words, a little more musket fire coming right up. I think this is a still from one of the Joseph Smith movies, actually, but I may be wrong on that. So we'll, I'm expecting the audience to educate. But yeah. It looks like it could it. be from that time period. So, but what we're trying to show here, excuse me, <clears throat> it's not a question as to whether Elder Holland's musket fire speech was adopted and run with by members of the Desnac crowd. We have proof that it was, and that's the proof that we're showing you. And all I can say is that, I think I said this last week, I don't want to repeat myself, but for a church leader to use this kind of language is reckless. But for a church leader to use this kind of language when he knows that there is a group of alt-right individuals who are into violence, who are looking for a green light from a leader in order to move forward with that. That is not just reckless. That's beyond the pale, in my opinion. And it's even worse because the group that he's addressing when he uh, speaks ill of the person who gave the valedictorian speech and then addresses the LGBT uh, issue and various facets of it, is he's also choosing to use that violent rhetoric against a group that um, already is marginalized and has actual violence committed against them. Right. Good point. And, and I'll add to that is that it's, it's not a good look from a, uh, just from a perspective of someone claiming to be a prophet, seer and revelator to not foresee what it would be, you know, who would run with it and why. Yeah. Not very good foresight. Nope. Right. So we just talked about Greg Smith, who's a Desnap member, saying time to get our muskets. But also, even further up, I think maybe than the City Council of Ogden, was an individual named Matthias, I think it's Chicote, C-I-C-O-T-T-E. He was an assistant attorney general in Alaska. And I say was because it's past tense. Do you remember J. Reuben Clark? And by that, I mean the Desnap member who was posting under the name J. Reuben Clark. Well, that was actually Mr. Matthias Chicote, the wow. former assistant attorney general in Alaska. So here's what happened in July of 2021. Investigative journalists at The Guardian identified Matthias Chicote, an Alaska assistant attorney general, as a poster of racist and anti Semitic Deseret nationalist content using the Twitter account at J. Reuben Clark. Following the release of the report, civil rights organizations, including the NAACP, called for the termination of Chicote from his position and the reopening of his cases. This prompted an investigation from the Alaska Department of Law, and Chicote was removed from his caseload. A department spokesman, spokesperson, excuse me, confirmed Chicote was no longer working for them, <laughs> i.e. fired, stating However, although we cannot talk about personnel matters, we do not want the values and policies of the Department of Law to be overshadowed by the conduct of one individual. Shortly thereafter, the deans of J. Reuben Clark Law School, which is where he went to law school, of which both Jacoby and Alaska Attorney General Craig Taylor are graduates, released a statement condemning the venomous and hateful Twitter messages against a variety of vulnerable groups from the at J. Reuben Clark account the, so it's one thing for people who are in their parents basement typing out this kind of uh threatening and violent memes and imagery but 
I get a little bit more concerned when I find out that they are actually in government up to the point of being an assistant attorney general. This one in Alaska. Your thoughts? The assistant attorney general of the state of Alaska was a Desnat member making deeply egregious comments online. Right. And to be clear, okay, it's bad enough, but there is an attorney general. All right. It's like in, in any county, you've got a prosecuting attorney, usually an elected official, and he or she appoints deputies, right? And they're deputy prosecutors and they do you know, most of the work. This is an assistant attorney general. It's the same idea. There's an attorney general and there's all these assistant, these AAGs is what we call them. So this is not the AAG. It's an AAG. That's all I'm saying. But this person had gotten up far enough in the government to be in this position of authority. This is why they wanted their cases reopened after he was cashiered to see if his values had influenced how he had prosecuted cases. So this is really wow. where it starts to get alarming. Obviously, this is huge for DESNAP members because they would love to get into positions where they have power to exercise and enforce their own views. But it causes me concern because we don't know how many others there might be in positions like this. If there's one, there could be more. Ryan, what do you think about that story? Were you aware of that when it happened? I, I did not see that one when it happened. Um, what I think about it is, as I think, I mean, yeah, it's easy to get addicted to trolling on Twitter because it's fun and it's easy to say outrageous things and make people mad because it's fun. And obviously, you know, you've got this group that started out with a lot of, a lot of people and a lot of people with, you know, that kind of came together again on that Venn diagram and it's boiled down and a lot of the good people have evaporated out of it for one reason or the other. Maybe they have stories like mine, maybe they have other stories, but which what you're left with is the fact that it was dirty water to begin with and now it's mud. Hmm. And good analogy. And, and it's just going to get worse because anyone reasonable is going to continue to leave. Maven, could you read this um, comment that you have up there on the screen? <clears throat> because I think this is from a news story. It's an opinion it piece. Really, opinion yeah. piece, thank you. I think it does a really good job of briefly describing what Desnet is in its essence. So this is from the Salt Lake Tribune. And I believe this, even though it's an opinion piece, which many people can write in and do, I do think Peggy Fletcher Stack is the one that wrote this. Um, apologies if I got the attribution wrong. Um, but this is a, a paragraph from that. While not everyone who uses the hashtag Desnet hashtag seems to share these misogynistic, homophobic, and racist views, Chapman said in a statement, they dwell in a space where those views are tolerated, welcomed, and shared. The fact that, and have you been saying Chicote? I don't know how to say yes. it. The assistant attorney general who reportedly is posting as J. Reuben Clark is in a position meant to uphold the rights of all and who has influence over civil rights litigation at the state level. She said, it seems antithetical to the purpose of his position. And then there's another quote from that. Um, so that that speaks to Radio Free Mormon's concern on the political and, and you know state national level. The next is with the church. These hardline views on church doctrine and the authority behind them are common in hashtag Desnet. And mes many Desnatters believe that they're in lockstep with church leadership. If that's not the case, the church needs to make it that clear to them, the scholar said, if it is the case, that also poses problems. It's one thing for Clark to see himself as sifting out the unrighteous on Twitter, but has he ever done so as an elders quorum president, a bishop? And that's the end of the quote. That's Thank a very you. common that comment. Part, I'm sorry, what, Ryan? I was going to say that's a very common comment, by the way, among Desnats and even some other apologists online is that uh, they're sifting. You know, they're doing the Lord's work by sifting out the people who don't belong. Um, when I've had debates with uh, Mormons uh, on, on various web forums since leaving about current, you know, certain things, there are, there's a certain element to them that kind of fit into this Desnap milieu that um, the first thing they'll say is, well, God didn't want you. He sifted you out. And again, the ah. intention is just to piss me off. Right. So right. take it for what it is. I'm like, you know, I've been, I was you. 
it doesn't hurt me and and we'll continue to debate the facts and win but there are certain people who uh, that's a very hurtful comment to frankly hmm. i just wanted to cross-reference this one remark here where it says if that's not the case in other words if the church does not support desnat the church needs to make that clear to them the scholar said in cross-reference that with what we started with in the news story where the church is saying they're not going to get into this they're not going to get involved in this right now. It seems to be an abdication of what should be a very basic and fundamental responsibility that the leaders of the church have to all their members. So having said that, what's next? Are, or do we have the, um, the video next? Yes. Um, so we're going to show a meme that was made by Desnat about John DeLynn and Fair Mormon. This is when their twi uh, tits videos came out. And so I did want to say um, for those watching, I guess, a content warning. And I have it there on the screen. Uh, we are going to show the clip. It's from the movie Inglorious Bastards, which is rated R. And this is a pretty graphically violent scene. Um, do you guys want to add any more uh, context for those who are listening. No, I just want to say that this is definitely a Desnat production and what they're championing is Fair Mormon and the production of the TITS videos. Okay. Because you'll see how it works out there. Those are the ones who end up uh, beating to death. John DeLynn portrayed here by a Nazi uh, prisoner and then someone else who's identified as Jeremy Reynolds, who wrote the CES letter. So this is like their, I'm not going to use that expression. This is um, their idea of dream fulfillment. All right. This is a dream come true. This is their vision. And Maven's smiling because she knows what I'm not saying. Anyway, this is like, oh, this is exactly what we love Fair Mormon because they're putting it, they're sticking it to John DeLynn with these TITS videos. And they're also sticking it to the CES letter. And this is what it is that they produced. And this is what it is that Kwaku L retweeted two years ago this month in December of 2020. All right. So warning has been given. Now take your wiener snit so they can finger and point out on this map what I want to know. Hi everyone, it's John DeLynn. Actually, we're all tickled to hear you say that. But frankly, watching Donnie beat Nazis to death is as close as we ever get to going to the movies. Donnie! Yeah? Gosh, German here wants to die for the country. Oblige him. So there you have um, this Desnet production, yeah. which champions just, Fair Mormon and the go ahead, the TITS videos and Stone 16, which was another production that Quaku L was involved with briefly. I think it was his deal. Maybe. Um, yes, it's a an apologetic channel. I think it's still going or I'm actually not sure. 
on that one. But that was one of the I haven't seen any new stuff that? drop for them. Yeah. But yeah, right. it, was. it was very much an apologetic thing. So it was interesting to me that that Quaku's defense on this was that he had only retweeted it. He hadn't created it. But then that's what I was listening to and hearing you say earlier, Ryan, that part of the the Desnat thing was to take these outrageous videos and memes. And if you liked them or thought they were really effective to retweet them, to give them a bigger audience. Right. And so, yeah, oh, go ahead, Ryan. Uh, I was just going to say this one's this one's just stupid. I mean, we talked about it before that, you know, it's they've run out of facts, but it's this particular video is like spiking the football on your own 20 yard line and claiming victory. It's they can't win on facts. Their interpretations of the facts suck. And so they act like clowns. This is me directly calling out the Midnight Mormons. But, you know, they play the victim in, in everything else like they did with your debate by wearing body armor. And then they put on this tough guy act when it comes to their memes. Anybody can make a meme. Right. And you had said something in our phone call about how, you know, you have really very little question that anything would actually be done, you know, that anything violent would be done to John DeLynn. But on the other hand, you said, if it were your name there, you might feel differently. Exactly. And, you know, obviously there are oh, people may come at me for this and I, I would feel differently about it and and it is what it is but if my name was on there i would feel a lot differently than someone who saw it as an outsider and said hey that's just stupid or if i was a desnat said yeah you stuck it to him the fact of the matter is is that fair mormon and tits and all of their little silly things they haven't won any battles they can't celebrate they lose every day. Oh, and that's what you mean by spiking the football on their own 20 yard line. Yeah. And claiming and, and Yeah, and walking off the field. Hey, we just won the Super Bowl. You didn't do anything. You made a video. <laughs> well, here was uh, Samantha Hopkins who had responded to this whole controversy <clears throat> about Quakuel retweeting this uh, Desnat video. And let's see here. Bill, can we get you in here to read what Samantha Hopkins said? Basically Samantha to... Uh, the Quaku. Yep. Samantha Hopkins replying to Quaku L and she also tags John DeLynn in it. I don't know how you think this is helping anyone. You're just digging a bigger hole in my opinion. Where is the humility? If something upsets someone, it's best to apologize. Even if you personally did not find it offensive. And then Quaku says, I am digging a hole and it's his grave. That's again, you have to be smarter you and I have been doing this for years, RFM. I would be, I, I would, I would be hard pressed to find a single statement that you made or I made encouraging some sort of violence on another person, even if somebody wanted to try to twist our words. I don't think it could be done. And and here you have Quaku going like, "Yeah, I said it. In fact, I'm going to make it worse." You know, um, to me, it is it just speaks of irresponsibility. But that's his mo. I mean, this is the guy in the middle of COVID being understood to be extremely dangerous to society, he went ahead and ensured that his parties went on. Right, right. And young and dumb will only serve as an excuse for so long. Yeah. Eventually you become old and dumb. Yeah. But <laughs> no, and here's one thing I wanna say about this, okay? Is that we're gonna show a couple other things about Midnight Mormons. And I'm not saying that they are connected or they're members of Desnat. All I'm saying is that they end up using a lot of the same tactics. I think we have evidence for that. I'm not sure about going all the way and saying that they are associated with Desnat, but regardless, does it make any difference who you're associated with if you're pursuing the same kind of outrageous shock and awe and violent imagery tactics? Just an FYI, so he, yeah. I, had a, I had a science yeah. teacher who said that Ignorance is for now, but stupid is forever. <laughs> hey, that's good. I like that. I like that science teacher. Well, this also happened two years ago, and it's at the same time as this Inglorious Bastards video meme. And some fellow who's a Desnet member named uh, Elder Hyde, okay? <laughs> he has a lot of pictures of Bowie knives. He likes knives. He likes sharp things. They appear to be deep, different knives. And he says, uh, this looks like Twitter. Yeah, this is Twitter. Says John DeLynn doesn't have the brain power to think his way out of a paper bag. He's a flipping 
retard. I know who he is. I've talked to him. He's a dumb apostate. I'm sorry, okay? And if he ever messes with me, if he ever puts me into some sort of self-defense situation, if he puts me in a self-defense and I have to legally defend myself, I'm not going to initiate violence against him. But if he comes at me in an alleyway, tries to do anything, I'm going to mess him up so badly. I will put him in the flipping ground in a flipping box. I'll take extra time. I'll take extra time, okay? It won't be a quick self-defense situation. I'll be punching him in the back. I'll be punching him in the back of the neck. I'll be boxing his eyes in. I'll break both his orbital bones. I'm going to destroy John DeLynn. Oh, there's more. I'm going to destroy John DeLynn physically so badly that the people who come to clean her up, I think he means him up. I think he got uh, gender confused there. That the people who come to clean him up, they're going to be puking when they see what I did to him. All right. I want them to know how I feel about him. So I'm going to flip him up so bad that he makes them puke when they see his bruised, mangled body. And then he says, if he ever did anything to me to warrant that legally. Now, I would never, ever initiate violence against him, but that's what would happen. Hashtag Desbola. And we have pictures of these knives. And then the last one has a picture of this individual, Elder Hyde, presumably, <laughs> that shows his freaking face holding out a Bowie knife at the camera. I'm not sure who's holding the camera. I think that's a little bit too far away for a selfie. Any comments about this while I try I, to recover? <laughs> I, I have a couple. I think one of the things that is funny to me is where he said, if he ever puts me into some sort of self-defense situation. Um, and I'm trying to find the comment. Oh, here it is. Um, uh, Mary Joy O'Grady. She says, John DeLynn is one of the last people on earth who would threaten anyone in an alley. And I agree. He's a really big guy, but he's, he's a teddy bear, I think. And I think it also just goes to show, I think they really, they know that wanting to perpetrate this violence outright is bad. So I, I, that's what I'm seeing from Elder Hyde here is that he knows that that's going too far. So the best way that he can, I'll say what you weren't going to say, RFM, um, like have his wet dream basically is to um, it, try to imagine John DeLynn in a creepy alley, like coming up on right. him and being like, I'm going to attack you. And then just, just giving this guy the opportunity to really live out these violent fantasies he has. It's just absurd. It's profoundly absurd. And I, I believe this guy was never identified. Um, there's another picture of him here. So if anyone happens to know who he is, um, let us know. Yeah. Anyone else's You're thoughts muted. on that? Oh, yeah. I have two quick RFM. two quick points. <laughs> RFM. Yeah, go ahead. Saying this guy needs to get to the gym as well. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say this is another guy who skipped the Arnold Freeberg lessons of Mormonism. Um, <laughs> and, and and second of all, the reason why he's couching it as a self defense situation is because then he can try not to get banned by the moderators at Twitter, and and say, well, if and I mean, I guess the last thing I'll say with all of that is if you've got to say it. You ain't got it. Somebody like this would have been run out in the early days of, of people like me getting together. We would have just written him off as a crazy. And I think, RFM, you're, okay. you're the lawyer here. But uh, if, there, if he was in a legitimate self-defense situation and he took his time, really took his time, like he said, to fillet him up. I, I'm just curious how that goes for self-defense in the, in the court of law. Uh, how, how does that look? Not well. Self-defense is permissible as a defense, but only against the reasonable uh, fear uh, and only insofar as reasonably necessary to defend oneself. Not to mention yeah. you got a stack of tweets that aren't going to look good in front of a jury of your peers. Right. That's true. So here he is. <laughs> and by, he kind of looks like, oh, what was it? It's Mr. Peabody. Who's that kid who's with him? Mr. Peabody and that kid, you remember? Because that's who he looks like is the kid. Sherman. Yes, this is my Mr. Peabody, and this is my boy Sherman. Right, this is I'm Sherman. old enough to get that one. Okay. I'm glad that's Sherman. That's who he looks like, and 
if you recognize this individual, uh, please call police and report him because I think some investigation needs to be done. This is what happens when you don't put a bandana over your face, Sherman. So what he says, though, is interesting. Me holding out the Bowie knife at the camera with his bare chest bristling with three hairs, I think. It says, me, when I see John DeLynn start complaining about Fair Mormon's new videos. Okay? So he's putting the knife to John DeLynn there in this picture. But the interesting link is he's a fan of the new Fair Mormon videos, which would have been the tits videos, which came out two years ago, December, were discontinued in March. But they came out in December. So they I can't that say good that. Either. By the way, remember, Fair Mormon was for them before they were against them. Exactly. That's the John <laughs> Yes. So here we've got this guy. I can't say if the love affair goes both ways, but this Desnat guy and others definitely have a total crush on the tits videos that Fair Mormon put out, such that when John DeLynn starts complaining about them, the Sherman here feels like, oh, I'm going to cut you up for that because you shouldn't be complaining about these great videos that are doing such a great job defending the church. <laughs> right. Where's his garment? I'm muted. I just stopped talking. <laughs> the All right. So where's do his you have garment? anything next? Maven? Now, this is from Quaku, and this is interesting, okay? This is apparently from his... Twitter account. Now, who found this and who wants to talk about it? Um, um, I found ahead, it, I think. Um, I was just, and what stood out to me from this was just the fact that, um, I mean, and like we've talked about, uh, Desna as a group isn't um, necessarily cohesive, but they're, they're just certain. Or I guess like Ryan said, if you had a Venn diagram, um, if you had misogyny, racism, homophobia, some will be some of those and not all of them, but um, but racism is something that's really common. And so despite the fact that Quaku is happy to retweet their their memes and their violent memes, and he's totally in on board, uh, the fact that he is not white is something that to at least a portion of Desnat um, does not, it, it, he's not able to curry enough favor, I think, to get over the fact that he's not white for some. So this is this is his tweet. Um, and so he had tweeted out, this is again at the beginning of filming for these videos. So Quaku's original tweet says, my second trip to LA in one week, when you write slash film a new show taking down the CES letter, you gotta do it right. Can't wait for you guys to see it. And he's got a picture of himself at the airport and one kind of like if he's holding his phone and, and just, taking a picture of his shoes that he's wearing. Uh, that's what he took a picture of. And then right, he got some new fancy shoes that he wants right. to off. So he takes a picture of them and posts it on uh, Twitter. Right. And then we don't see, cause he cut it off uh, who it was that retweeted, but they, they use the N word and they say that he stole those shoes from the bowling alley and it's, there's <laughs> laughing emojis from that. And then in the comments after that, this is what we see on the right here. Um, one user who go, his the username is Hoss H O S S Desnat Newsman just types one letter N, and then the next one comes in with I, and it goes on from there um, to start spelling out the N word. So, um, and one of them even has hashtag Hear Him on there uh, as part of their user display name. So that's kind of interesting, I thought. Anyway, mm. this is what stood out to me was just, yeah, Kwaku is not white enough for Desnat, but he still seems to be happy to uh, jump onto their means when it's when it's not about racism, but when it's about apostates, um, he is right in line and he's using a lot of their similar tactics. And, right, and so I want to go ahead and say, just to fill this out, Kwaku is, presenting this with um, uh, his main statement above it, I hate Desnat. So I wanna make sure that's clear, that here he's saying I hate Desnat because he posts this picture of his new shoes. Somebody apparently Desnat says, dis, 
And then they say, you said the N word, it's N-I-G-G-A. I'm spelling it because it makes sense with what happens next. This N-I-G-G-A stole those shoes from the bowling alley, then the laughing emojis. And then someone, and I don't know if it's Kwaku, it could be Kwaku. It says, spell the word correctly. Apparently the N word, right? Spell, spell the word correctly. Does it make it less offensive? You know, if you say N-I-G-G-A, that's not less offensive than the, the correct spelling. At which point then several apparently different accounts start. One says N, the next one says I, the next one says G, the next one says G, the next one says E, and then it stops. And I don't know why it stops there, but it's obvious where it was going. So that's the context for that. And this was really interesting when I saw that because it reminded me of a story that the audience doesn't know about, but that I heard from Bill Reel a couple of weeks ago when he was streaming a different podcast. I think it was the Almost Awakened podcast. Is that right, Bill? Can you tell us a story? Yeah. So we were doing, uh, I don't know what episode it was number wise, but it was almost awake, uh, awakened and it was on human biases. And this was, uh, this streamed out uh, about one o'clock on November 29th, uh, 2022. And so me and Brittany Hartley are in our live stream. We're doing a show and our show almost awakened has nothing to do with Mormonism. Uh, we barely mention it. And, uh, but what it does have to do with is second half of life, how to help people who leave the church develop the tools necessary to be productive, responsible, healthy, happy human beings on this side of, of life. And we're about halfway into the episode. And um, we are talking about cash bias, that when someone's uh, living is based on uh, the things they believe, it will be very hard to talk them into a new belief. And suddenly in the chat, the live chat, and again, the way YouTube works, folks here will see it, but off to the, to the right of the video, so I'm pointing the op opposite direction, but so it points to the correct way, but off to the right of your screen of the section you're watching, there's this super chat kind of that's going on. And then when the video gets done being live, all the comments now go down below. So off to the side um, in the super chat, suddenly this profile shows up and his name is Nick space g h u r r and he jumps in and he starts to spell the n word go ahead can i hang on just a second so you're saying this this person with their handle is nick gur nick gur yes and again i want to okay. be careful i, I don't i don't want to come close to being offensive i want to recognize that it, we're trying to report on the offensive things happening so right. in the super chat this person by the name of nick space g h u r r nick gur starts to spell out the n word and i i immediately put him in a timeout within 40 seconds another profile shows up with the same name minus one of the two r's at the end of the last name and starts to complete the person's word g g and then i block him and i block the first one and then another person shows up and i think if you go back and you watch the video I think those comments are going to be gone now, but I think you'll see the moment where I stop because Britt asked me a question and I'm trying to handle this stuff going on in the chat and she needs to repeat her question. So you can know at the moment when it's happening. So I block these profiles. Another one shows up. His name is fantasy something, but fantasy is spelled uh, P H A N T A S Y and then something else. And he starts to respell the word again. I, bl I block him immediately. Beautiful thing about StreamYard is if you want to try to sabotage the show, you'll get about three seconds of time and we'll, we'll make sure you're gone. It's one of the things Maven does behind the scenes. Um, so I get rid of it. We continue our conversation, not more than four or five minutes. And then suddenly I'll put it up on the screen here. Suddenly Cardin Ellis shows up as in watching, by the way, I know this is Cardin Ellis because if I, if I go over here, uh, this is just a picture, so I can't do it here. Whoop. Let me get rid of that. This is just a picture. But if in my screen where this was visible, if I click on Cardin Ellis's name, it takes me right to Cardin Ellis's YouTube channel. It is absolutely his persona. So Cardin Ellis comes in. He's watching the Almost Awakened podcast. That seems strange. Um, he He starts paying so that his comments are highlighted. You folks have seen it when you donate to our show in a super chat. 
which most of the time it's not a super chat. Most of the time it's a donation feature. And sometimes I forget to turn it on and then it ends up being a super chat and you can end up buying uh, a, a highlighted message that you put. Cardin Ellis came, comes on, he pays $9.99 first and he asks this question. And then he comes in a minute later and he pays $1.99 to ask another question. And I, again, I, I'm not, I'm not able to say anything about the connection. I only say it is a very strange coincidence that for the first time ever, people come in to sabotage the show in the way that they did. And then within a few minutes, Cardin Ellis, who seems to care less about the content we put out because we've invited him to respond and Midnight Mormons to respond to things we've done. And they often take a long time and most of the time don't respond at all. Um, he purchases these two questions in the same show, only minutes apart. And these questions have to do with the topic we were talking about when the distraction happened. And I just want to note that that is odd. And then, and again, I, I'm, I'm also, there's lots of other things. There's this other thing too, where years ago, uh, Kwaku was creating fake profiles and he created a fake profile named Dave Schmidt, which was a white teenage face. And we collected enough evidence behind the scenes to prove almost conclusively and to the point where we knew that Kwaku knew it was a fake profile and it almost assuredly was him um, of this person named Dave Schmidt so that he could go online as a white person and make more harsh comments than, uh, than he would do under his own identifiable persona. Okay, so let me just say a couple of things. First off, that, that could be a coincidence. It could be. With the, uh, the N and then the I and then the G and then the G and the different accounts and being blocked and then Cardinella shows up at a place where I would never expect Cardinellis to be. I mean, if he's gonna be in live chat, I would expect it would be here on Mormonism Live, not on yeah. Almost Awakened, which really doesn't have anything to do with Mormonism very much, right, Bill? No, no, and, and I did I did respond to his questions, not on air, but I did send him a private Facebook message and answer his questions, which I don't think are anything that we would need to duck from. They're, they're just questions that are easy to answer. Right, the thing that is not a coincidence is this idea of trying to spell that word in separate posts, each containing one capital letter. So it appears down the screen instead of across the screen, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, which is identical to what was going on at the almost awakened versus what was going on in that tweet that, uh, that, that Quaker had shared. Now here's something that struck me, which I thought was interesting. We've got Desnat who really likes the slogan, Brigham Young did nothing wrong. And here we've got a post that says, which one do you like better? They've got a picture of Brigham Young holding a Bowie knife, which is Photoshopped in, saying Brigham Young did nothing wrong. And then they've got one with Brigham Young holding a revolver pointed at the observer, saying Brigham Young did nothing wrong. So which one do you like better, Brigham Young with a Bowie knife or Brigham Young with a revolver? But this whole slogan of Brigham Young did nothing wrong. After Elder Holland gave his musket speech in August of 2021, Midnight Mormons did a podcast in which they defended him. The thing that struck me was the title of their podcast, which we have up there. And guess what the title of their podcast was? Elder Holland did nothing wrong. So is this another coincidence? I don't know. I'm just making the observation and letting the audience draw whatever conclusions they want to draw. And remember, there was a meme or two earlier that said Elder Holland did nothing wrong as well, directly from Desnap. Right. Your thoughts about this, Ryan? Yeah, I mean, they're clowns. They're just trying to be edgy, and that's that's really all I'd say about them. Is I mean, I watched the debate with URFM, and and they showed up in in body armor and and they're clowns. Which, incidentally, you could tell from the screen if we're empty plate carriers i've worn body armor and i know what an empty plate carrier versus a full one looks like and it was just so that they could play the victim and you know while we're on the subject card and your flag flag patch was backwards and you know it and your excuses were just about as hollow as your apologetics <laughs> <laughs> i hope he's watching all right 
I hope he's watching. Oh, Maybe uh, he, he will be. We might see him dollars. in the live chat. We'll look. We'll, we'll look for him there. Um, oh, and here's something else. This is uh, this is a statue of Brigham Young at BYU with I think photoshopped on it as if it were graffiti on the base of the statue. Did nothing wrong. Hashtag Desnat. And then over here is another one. Um, Maven, I think you found this one. Did you interpret this? The one with it looks like a headstone that says oh, Lego Joseph Smith on top of a hill. Yes, it's a so it, this is again from. Yeah, you said it. Lego Joseph Smith. It's so the hill says Jeffrey R. Holland did nothing wrong. And the tombstone has Lego Joseph Smith um, implying that this is a hill he's willing to die on. Uh, I think is the phrase that's being portrayed here. Yeah, and that was August 30th, 2021. So shortly after the speech, the musket speech was given. So yeah, this is something that's very common among the Desnet crowd. And then we see it over at Midnight Mormons. I mean, I don't know what's going on here, but there does seem to be, whether there's a connection between the two, I'm not here to say. All I'm saying is I'm seeing a lot of the same things on both sides, on the Desnet side and on the Midnight Mormon side. Right, and we have a clip from uh, from Midnight Mormons uh... Um, I guess seeming to agree with us in, in one way. Are we, are we ready for that? Maven, would you introduce this? Because this is one clip that occurred to you and you wanted mm -hmm. to present this. And I think it's a great idea. Okay. Um, so so this was a clip I from their episode claiming, uh, I think, hypocrisy among uh, um, ex-Mormons about, I think, this kind of messaging where we, we talk about the about rhetoric and the violence and with the whole musket speech and so um yeah so i, I don't know I, I think that's all i want to say about it before go ahead and playing it unless you think i've forgotten something mark them no great that's fine okay Please. well i mean so what's gonna happen I'll, I'll, you repeat every day the church hurt you the church hurt you and and the mormons are bad the mormons are bad and they're trying to harm you they're trying to harm you all it takes is one crazy guy with a gun to go into a chapel and I'm in, like people don't understand how easily that happens especially yeah. in the era of riots we're already living in when something terrible happens and I hate to say it but it's gonna happen Dylan and Zelf and Runnels and Real and Radio Free Mormon and Lindsay Hansen Park and all of these people will have blood on their hands uh, you know, I, I can see where you're coming from on that. I would like to think that each individual is responsible for their own sins, but you can't overlook rhetoric. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You literally can't overlook rhetoric. I can I, can I just say something real quick? Yeah. In fact, I won't say anything. I can just put it up on the screen. Um, I've never said anything. I don't think, again, I would invite anyone to find something I've said where I've encouraged any sort of violence. And here's Kwaku condemning me, even though I've never said anything. And here's Kwaku talking about digging a hole and it's John DeLynn's grave. That was going to be my point as well. Is what, what he said in the beginning, like the church hurt you, the church hurt you. So we can't say that. It's, it seems like he's saying it's not okay to point out harmful things about harmful organizations at all that that just doing that is somehow an invitation to violence um when it's just patently ridiculous and i know we didn't really bring it up but you know when he says all it takes is is one crazy guy with a gun um i i know we don't know if the club q shooter in colorado you know was aware of Holland's musket speech or not, but we are aware that he was raised LDS. And so we we know based on his age, it was definitely in, in his growing up years, if he was involved with the church, it, it's very homophobic. And there's an interview with his dad that also shows how homophobic uh, they are anyway, just with, with the fact that when he found out what his son has done, his very first concern was, why his son was in a gay club was his son gay and then when he found out he wasn't he was relieved and to to quote from this um from his father he says you know we're mormon uh we don't do gay that's what his father said and so we know that this guy has mormon ties and you know he has actually done what quaker was saying someone would do in a chapel which so far as as i'm aware i don't know of any apostates um 
that have gone into it, especially any that are motivated by uh, ex Mormon podcasters who have gone on and and lit up an entire Mormon service. So yeah, I and I condemn anybody who anybody on our side of things who's even right. thinking such a thing. I condemn you. Like don't don't do something stupid. Um, again, pay attention to what the voices in this space say. And the worst you got is Mike Norton joking around at least, or, or maybe in part serious about making a porn movie in a temple, which at the end of the day, doesn't hurt anybody. You might have to clean a little bit of fabric, but you're not hurting anyone. Um, in this space of post Mormons, there, there's nobody. Lindsay Hansen Park has, has right. blood on her hands. That, that's well, the most ridiculous, absurd thing. Again, you, as Ryan, as you pointed out, these guys can continue to be clowns and say ridiculous stuff. And the reality is we'll just stick to the data points. We'll keep deconstructing issues and we'll keep showing that this stuff doesn't add up. That, that right, whole argument ahead. is good. Right. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say that whole argument that he makes in that clip is tone deaf as can be. I mean, it's, it's pull the beam out of your own eye before you pull out the mode of your brothers. Yeah. Yeah. It's ridiculous because it's not like we're making up the fact that the church hurt people. If you, if you're worried that someone is going to do something because the church hurt them, stop hurting people, stop protecting child abusers, stop doing lying to people and gaslighting people yeah. and stop hurting people. And I condemn that violence for the record myself, yeah. condemn it a hundred percent. But to, to claim that the critics of the church are the, the cause of something like that. No, the critics of the church are the critics of the church because of what you're doing. What What's worse to make an, uh, an inference that you're going to film a porn movie in a temple or to make an inference that you're digging uh, John DeLynn's grave, um, especially in light of the other violence that the that the comment comes in light of, which is Samantha is speaking out about the the Inglorious Bastards uh, clip. Um, if you have the ability to look in the mirror as a responsible human being, you have to recognize you're the one who is saying more serious uh, verbiage that is encouraging violence. And I wanted to point right. out too. Um, oh, sorry. Thanks, RFM. Um, just that uh, everything that we talk about, it's issues, it's systems. Uh, the phrase is said all the time, systems, not people. So there's no way that that going up and shooting up a church would actually help or solve anything at all. But on the flip side, the people who are uh, getting different treatment or violence because of rhetoric like Elder Holland's musket speech, like like you pointed out earlier, the LGBT community is marginalized. Um, they they are kicked out of their families a lot, or at least not accepted by them, um, at the very least. And they do experience actual violence. So it, that is towards individuals of a certain group, not systems. Whereas what we talk about, or Lindsay, or John, or anybody else, um, Zelf on the Shelf, it's always pointing out the harms caused by the doctrines and the practices of the church. So it's never about, yeah. you know, apples and oranges. It's a big, yeah, difference. the people in the pews. Totally. That's it. I was going to say three things real quick. First off, uh, Quaku saying that Lindsay Hansen Park et al. will have blood on their hands. Seems pretty rich to me from a guy who retweeted the Inglorious Bastards video and then is saying, like, I'm digging a hole and it's his grave. The second thing has to do with Cardinellis who insists that rhetoric matters. Rhetoric is important. You can't overlook the rhetoric. Well, these are the guys who are defending Elder Holland and Elder Holland did nothing wrong for using the rhetoric he used. So obviously you can disregard rhetoric if it's coming from church leaders or people with whom you agree. Amen. It's only other people who actually don't even use violent rhetoric. They're the problems and they're the ones who will have blood on their hands. But the overarching thing and the thing that's really helped me with this podcast to understand people like Midnight Mormons is so often we sit there and say, well, they're inconsistent. They say this over here. They say this over here. They have no connection to the facts. They make stuff up and they just blurt it out. It doesn't make any difference if it's true. And I think we spend enough time trying to hold them to the facts, to hold them to consistency. But then I realized this is the overlap between Desnet and Midnight Mormons. They're not trying to be consistent. Consistency is not important to them. Sticking to the facts is not important to them. All they're about is trying to shock and be outrageous 
and get attention and put other people back on their heels and try and get them offended and cowering and trying to destroy people. But that's all they do. There is no substance there. There is no there there. And so it suddenly made me realize that my spending time trying to analyze what they're saying in a logical fashion is like trying to play baseball on a hockey rink. Yeah. Yeah, you're playing two different games. Are we ready for some phone calls? Did you have anything you want to say at the end here, Ryan, before we take phone calls? You know, I, I think we covered everything I wanted to say and more. So it's um, it's a hard thing. And, and I well, I guess one thing does come to mind. Um, I was a political science major in college. My senior thesis was on uh, radicalism and, and fundamentalism in Islam. And I think that Desnet has largely some of the same problems that the terrorist groups have out there. And that is that there is no central leadership telling them what to do and what's not acceptable. They are left to their own devices to feel like they are supporting a cause and anything goes. And inevitably there is somebody that's gonna take it too far. Inevitably, it has to happen. Because when it guys get together to start measuring their body parts, you know, it, it's it's being outrageous, being offensive, being threatening. Well, you can only go so far in that arena. And eventually somebody's going to take it to the next level if they haven't already. So it's just, a, I don't think it's a matter of if, I think it's a matter of when. And I, I really want to call on the church right now to do the responsible thing. And that is to issue a statement and use the word desnat. Don't be so chicken. Don't be such cowards. Don't try and stay out of this like this isn't your fight or you don't have any responsibility here. They're your members. And these are the members who look up to you as leaders and believe that you sanction what they're doing. You have to call them out in no uncertain terms. No, oh, we're going to refer you to this statement over here. Or we've said, you know, Jesus loves people and we don't want violence. You're going to have to make it more plain than day to get the message across. And maybe then some of the Desnet members will think, wow, maybe they really mean it. But regardless of what Desnet members do with it, whether they think, oh, you've got to say this in order to uh, appeal to the outside world and you don't really mean it, you need to say it because it's the right thing to do. It's your responsibility. And all this stuff is proliferating while you're dilly dallying away and not calling a spade a spade. Absolutely. Amen. Yep. All right. Do some calls. Yes, please. All right. So I believe, and, and we've got three callers in the line. So I'm going to, I'm actually going to suspend new calls. We'll do these three here. The first one is Francis. Uh, Francis, you are on Mormonism live. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Uh, you are really, can you guys hear him loud and clear? I can hear him. Okay. Can you get a little bit closer to the phone? Him. Maybe Francis. Oh, sorry. Just be a little louder, my friend. Uh, okay. Um, so thank you for uh, letting me on. This is great. I love the podcast. Um, I guess my question um, for you, and I know you covered this a little bit with talking about uh, what the church needs to do and with these fringe groups inside of Mormonism. But I'm wondering, as, as speaking more generally on just the religious violence, uh, how, where else do you see that solution coming from? I, I know I've heard some people argue about reformation in like the radical Islamic group or uh, abolition with these groups. So I, I just love to hear any thoughts on that. Well, uh, Ryan, I'll let thoughts? you address that. My thought is that if these people acknowledge church leaders as their leaders, and the ones that they're going to listen to and follow and obey, then I don't think there's anybody else who can even have a chance of addressing the issue other than the people that Desnet members believe to be the Lord's anointed. What do you think, Ryan? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I don't know that there's an easy solution for it. I think that uh, eventually with a group like this, you, you tend to have people like myself who ultimately burn out of it because they have some integrity left and then they find their way out. And then, like I said, you're left with the mud at the bottom of the pan, which is unfortunately something that we haven't found a solution for. That's a big, I mean, you're asking for a solution to one of the world's biggest problems over the last 25 years. 
and and more, frankly. Yeah. <clears throat> if we're talking about a solution to this sort of rhetoric, um, it, it seems as though Mormon leaders are their own worst enemy in that when you have a policy not to apologize, when you are adamant that you're not going to admit you've done something wrong, you've taken the solution, I think the real solution off the table. And imagine if, uh, imagine if President Nelson got up and said, I'm going to be crystal clear today. There have been leaders in our past who have said atrocious things, and I'm going to name some examples and then name two or three and go, I want to be crystal clear. Brigham Young, was not speaking as a prophet when he did those things. And I condemn that rhetoric. And it is not going to be the church uh, of, of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints from this moment going forward. And we will not tolerate any member of the church who makes threats to people. It will be handled in the same way as if you're masturbating. It's going to be handled in the same way as if you're looking at porn, which, as you already know, that sounds ridiculous. It's way more serious. So notice in Mormonism, the things that get punished and the things that don't. And if, if a president of the church stood up and was crystal clear on what we've done in the past, it's wrong. We condemn it. We apologize for the harm that we've done. We have been out of control at times. Our leaders, our theology, uh, and stories within our canon. And from this day forward, we're not going to do that anymore. And that message would be crystal clear. The church from that moment forward would understand where the new where the church stands from this point moving along. Can I say, Bill, I'm so impressed with that answer you gave off the cuff. This is one of the reasons that I'm so honored to be a co-host of the same podcast with you. And I mean that from the heart. Yeah. Thanks, my friend. All right. We'll go to another call. Uh, this is maybe the cultural hall. Uh, who am I speaking to? cultural hall you're yeah, right you are on the air i hear you a little quiet too but it might just be on my end if you don't mind just being a little louder and uh, you're on the air mormonism live with uh, myself with rfm and with ryan uh, and maven hi cultural hall i just want to say cultural hall has called in before is very active on tiktok or not tiktok sorry but on um on twitter and engages in desna on twitter regularly and quite funnily as well <laughs> funnily is a good word. Yeah, I try. Hashtag funnily. Go ahead, Cultural Hall. All right, RFM. Good to talk to you again. Bill, you weren't here last time I called in, so it's good to talk to you too, my friend. And uh, Ryan, thank you so much for coming on tonight. Uh, it was cool to hear from somebody who has been in the trenches and can kind of give us the, the insider look at things. Um, and so thanks for being courageous and coming on. I think that's, that's cool. Uh, and my question actually is for Ryan. So back when you were more active with Desnat, was it mostly a Desnat sausage fest or were there any, um, sisters who were involved in it? Cause there's, <laughs> there's a decent amount these days on Twitter. Uh, there were fewer back in the day for sure. It was mostly dudes. Okay, cool. All right. Thank you, my friend. Well, that was pretty quick. Thank you. Yeah, Cultural Hall. I don't know what else to say. There were, <laughs> there were only a couple. <laughs> All right. We're going to, we're going to move to the next call. Thank you. A couple, a couple of oh. them that are, oh, you're good guys. You're I'm good. Gonna, Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say a, a couple of them. Can, can I give a shout out to some of my favorites in case people don't know them? They could check out. I call them the dames of Desmat. Uh, you've got Lark Peep, who's a good one. If you guys are ever on Twitter, she's got some interesting takes. Uh, Kate is not well. I like to call her, but Kate is well, is one of them. And then there's also a girl named, she used to go by Senora, and then she was AKA Clump of Cells, and then she was, she's AKA Clementine now. So she's got some. Yeah, I'm familiar with her. Yep. Too, so. Yeah, those, those are some of my, my faves. So I, I just, just wanted to see if you, if you think it, the females are getting more active these days versus before. But thanks, guys. Have a good night. Thank you. Yeah. I think thank just to say, yeah, so I, I had a, a fun flurry of a, a week or two on Twitter in March of this year, which is where I became acquainted with Cultural Hall and, and many others, um, Mormon, Satan, etc. But I think what happens with women who are Desnet is kind of the same thing that happens with Quaku. It's just there's a lot of overlap 
with misogyny. So um, a lot of times women can come into these spaces and stick around, but a lot of times they don't because they're, it's, uh, someone said in the chat, like that these kinds of groups will often turn and eat their own. And so that is something that's really common. It just takes one time tweeting something that another does that person doesn't like or agree with. And then, and then they pile on you. So there's no loyalty there. So yeah, it does take a pretty, a pretty strong woman, I guess, to stay through that, or at least be able to avoid angering. Um, if she's saying the same misogynistic lines, and it's just, you know, as misogynistic and has internalized that as much as the men, then she's all right. And she she'll be able to stay, but it, it won't take long. I mean, a lot of things they say are just, you know, like women are a mess. That was one that someone had told to me as an excuse of why priesthood leaders need to be above them. It's just like, look at like, like we, we you, you can't function without us. And I, I feel like I'm functioning pretty well without a, a man being in charge of me. So anyway, it's, it's that kind of a thing. So it's possible, but there's that overlap there. And it's a, it's a tough community for that. Love it. Love it. Thank you, Maven. One of the things I'm taking away from this is that there are three things that probably should not go together. Sausage fests, masturbation, <laughs> and buoy knives. But that's just me. Do we have a, a third caller, Bill? We've got one more. So this is going to be, I believe, is this Joan? Yes, it is. All right, Joan. Glad to have you on. I'm aware of who you are. Go ahead and uh, you're on Mormonism Live with uh, the whole crew and Ryan. Uh, go ahead and share your thought. Okay. First of all, I've got two things. First of all, I'd like to really thank Ryan for giving me a new perspective on how my ex-husband must have felt being the head of a family and the pressure he would have been under. It doesn't excuse the way he behaves, but it does give me a bit of a more compassionate understanding of where he would have been. And the Thank second you. thing I'd like to say in the chat, I said that if we... What's that, Joan, in the chat? Oh, and in the chat, somebody, uh, I said that if people had a theocracy, um, their freedoms would be dented a lot more than they realise. And I think that if you took the church to its extreme thing in a total theocracy and you had to be totally obedient and not cherry pick which commandments you were going to obey, you would pretty soon find that your freedoms were restricted. And that's all I meant by it. It wasn't because I think you can choose to live a church life if you want to, but you don't really have the right to restrict other people's right to live. Love it. Thank you. That's all. Thank, thank you. you. Joan, thank you for your comments. I appreciate it. It makes me think of two things, one of which is that BYU is what Utah and the world would look like if the church had its way. No. That's number one. And the second thing, the second thing, <laughs> oh, what was it you had said about uh, uh, freedoms? Oh, yes, freedoms. Well, you would think that we would be progressing toward greater liberty in the church. And yet we're at the strange point where 200 years since its inception, it's the year 2022, and we have one of the senior apostles named Elder Bednar redefining agency as the ability to not choose what it is that you want to do. So now it's not free agency, it's moral agency, which he defines meaning as you have to do what we tell you to do. That's now the new definition of agency per Elder Bednar. Yeah, that, that's crazy that if you would have told me when you, you know, you and I were a little younger and we were both in the church, and I think there probably was maybe a little bit of overlap, if you would have told us that free agency would be done away and what would come out would be something the opposite of free agency where you are under obligation to do everything a certain way and, and your individuality is gone, I would have told you you're crazy and you would have told me I'm crazy. Yes. Well, you're still crazy. Yeah. I'm but... <laughs> But uh, no, absolutely. Everything is upside down. It's absolutely incredible. And apparently uh, the majority of active members of the church are not finding anything objectionable about it. No. Maven, do you have something to yeah. say? We're winding up. So let me let you give your closing comments. So, yeah, my, my thought was that 
and especially in a religion like ours where doctrine is always changing and what deserves orthodoxy and what doesn't is really up to a lot of opinions, individual, even as we know from leadership, that's why we have the term leadership roulette versus what will fly and what won't. Um, I think to go along and piggyback off of what Joan was saying, if we were to be in this fantasy that they that they think would be this perfect place where there are no apostates and there are no obese people, feminists, you know, it, it just all of the people that they hate are all gone and it's all like the good old days. Um, there's there's hardly a human alive. There isn't a human alive that could possibly match everything perfectly. So even the most hardcore Desnat people, I think they don't realize how quickly they could come under the ire of such a system and how quickly they can be uh, booted out. And uh, part of that is just to do with power. And we've seen this in group. I mean, we saw this with Joseph Smith. And then also, if you see um, some, of the, some of these shows about Warren Jeffs, you have your cohorts, you have your men that are your friends and that are in with you. But if they start to get a little bit too powerful, then your friends become your enemies. And so even if you are the tyrant or the dictator's absolute best friend, there's no guarantee that you will stay that way, that there's not some point where you will differ with them and then... and you'll be surprised at how quickly it, it, it everything is against you now and you're on the outs with everyone else uh, with the very people that you pushed out yourself so i just wanted to that, that those yeah. are my final thoughts on this idea of a, of a desert nation it's nobody's paradise not even theirs no good point thank you very much ryan do you have anything to close out with you know i i really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys and uh talk about all of this and share a little bit of my story. Um, and, you know, shout out to my buddies in, in Idaho and Arizona who are watching tonight, but I told them I'd tell them, <laughs> but uh, just thank you. And um, be patient with the people that are going to come out of this. Uh, you're going to see, and, and I am seeing over the past couple of years, a lot of people that were once like me that are, that are changing. And, and, and be patient with them deconstructing their entire identity more so than just what they believed about the church. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on, Brian, and sharing this part of your life, uh, two different parts of your life with us and your expertise yeah. as we've been talking about this. Really appreciate it. If anything happens, if you get any trouble, you hear bumps in the night, put the bat signal up, I'll be there. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> All right. Talk to you All later. Right. Bye-bye, Ryan. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. See ya. Okay. Take it easy, guys. Is this, uh, yeah. are we done? We are almost done, except for our witty banter at the end of the show, Bill. Gotcha. Well, let's have some witty banter. What are you thinking? Insert witty banter. Actually, I've already said everything that I wanted to say. I'm really, really glad that we did tonight's show. I've actually had phone calls from listeners to the show who were concerned for my welfare, uh, even talking about this subject. Uh, mm -hmm. They didn't mention any concern for your welfare, but they did mention concern for mine. And I just think if we don't talk about it because we're scared of these, of Sherman, aren't we just sort of playing into their hands? Yeah. Aren't we being bullied that we're not even going to talk about them because yeah. we're worried that they're going to, I don't know, say mean things about us or yeah. post without their, without shirts on their hairless chests with a Bowie knife pointed at the camera. So I think that it's something that we need to talk about. I'm glad we've talked about it and hopefully talking about it will make it less scary and more, what would you say? Well, let's just say less scary. I'll, I'll just say this and then we can take off. I put a post because we had this conversation. Um, I don't know, let's say a little less than a week ago because you we were preparing for this, for this, where I, you told me that you've had people inform you that you shouldn't do this episode tonight. And I sat down and I was thinking like, what are all the reasons in which it would be normal or reasonable for someone to feel some apprehension when they speak publicly in this space? And I put a post on Facebook where I said, maybe I'm crazy. Here's all the things I think about inside Mormonism, you know, Danites and whistling Whitlers and blood atonement and uh, SCMC and threats from Trevor Shane Bowen, uh, uh, Shane Bowen's son. At this point, 
there's enough things that would give me pause that if I haven't stopped talking about Mormonism now, you could probably lump a few more threats on top and it isn't going to do much good. Um, I just don't think these voices, you, me, and other folks in this space, uh, we're the kind of folks who want to shine a light on something, uh, even if there is some perceived dangers that are possible out there. And uh, I don't think Desnat's going to convince me to to stop talking. They've got a lot of other uh, trashy stuff in Mormonism that they can just get in line with. Yeah, there's a lot of things that I could say about Desnat members uh, that might not be fit for prime time, but I think I'll just say that my perception is they're just a bunch of paper tigers. Yeah. Fold them up, make a paper airplane and just throw it up. 